Zega Grande Skydom. How much time had passed since our arrival here? With our battles against the Church of Avia and the pacification of many primals, it certainly felt like a lifetime. But now that things were a little quieter, we were content to return to our usual bread and butter, satisfying requests from locals. Though the crew was accustomed to quests of all sorts, one day, there came a demand that left us puzzled. Sorry for the confusion, folks. This request isn't for the whole crew. It's an escort mission for Lancelot, specifically. Me? But why? There were few in this Skydom who had even heard of my name. Curious, I asked about Hans, the man who had posted the quest. Oh, you don't know him? Seems like he was real familiar with you. Anyways, he's a butler for the Lord of Grosgard. I hesitated. There was nothing I could do that another crewmate couldn't accomplish just as well. Acknowledging a specific request for me felt... Discourteous, in a way. You're not at your fancy-ass court anymore, okay? On our ship, you don't have to worry about rubbing anyone's ego the wrong way. If you're interested in the job, just take it. Though he may not have been... tactful, Eugen was, as ever, a fount of wisdom. Very well, then. I shall hear what this Hans has to say. It is a pleasure to meet you. I am Hans, butler to his lordship. The next day, an elderly man ambled onto the Grand Cipher, leaning heavily on his cane. But looking into his eyes, I sensed deep wisdom and a sharp mind. And the pleasure is mine. I am Lancelot, a Skyfarer. Forgive me for not accepting your request at once, but I would like more details before returning an answer. Yes, well, his lordship Ludwin is in need of an escort. Hans explained. Ludwin was a lord of Grosgar, and he was looking for a mythical sword passed down through his family for generations. So far, his search had led them to a snowy peak, but nearby monsters made the trip too dangerous to risk without protection. Does your lord not employ a personal guard? He does. But as this quest is for personal gain, he believes that commanding their service would be an abuse of power. However, the Lords of Grossguard have never been gifted in the martial arts. So if we head to the mountains without a decent sword arm, tragedy will surely befall us. But what led you to seek my sword arm specifically? Well, we knew we needed a highly experienced Skyfarer. The mission is dangerous. Far too dangerous for any amateur. But perhaps more importantly, his lordship is quite the fan of yours, Sir Lancelot. A... fan? My voice cracked in surprise. Yes, you are known as a knight exemplar, talented in both combat and scholarship. How fortunate that this very same Lancelot would come to our land and proffer his services. Whatever accounts you've heard of me were surely exaggerated. And so humble. Lord Ludwin will be overjoyed when he hears that we've secured your aid. The Honorable Sir Lancelot to protect us. What could be better? So, will you accept? Though this idolatry did not sit well with me, I could see no reason to refuse. From what I'd heard, Ludwin seemed an honorable man. Besides, there was much a lord of this Skydom could teach me. Very well. On behalf of our crew, I accept your request.
Hans and Ludwin were waiting for me at the foot of Mount Nagelith. It is an honor and a privilege to meet you, Sir Lancelot of Fiendrock. Hans has probably already told you who I am, but allow me to formally introduce myself. I am Ludwin, Lord Protector of Grosgarth. Though his aura was imposing and befitting of a lord, he also felt courteous and down-to-earth. The honor is mine. Though I am now no more than a Skyfarer, I swear to protect you and yours with my life, should it come to it. Well, whatever your title, I am glad to have your aid. Ludwin was beaming. Hans had told me of his excessive devotion, but it was another thing seeing it in person. I suddenly felt I wasn't quite sure how to conduct myself. Right. So you believe a family heirloom is hidden among these peaks? Not the sword itself. The first of a series of trials that shall reveal the blade in due time. I see. And what is the first trial? There's a record somewhere around here which should detail the whereabouts of the sword. A little game of my family's, if you will. But on second thought, perhaps a great knight such as yourself has nobler things to do than this frivolous treasure hunt in the snow. Yes, perhaps we had better call it... <clears throat> my lord. Hans was stern, more mentor than butler. The ancestral trials are not frivolous. Each one holds an important meaning. Those same challenges taught your father how to reign. Skies rest his soul. Yes, you're quite right. Forgive me, Hans. So, with that settled, I shall count on you, Sir Lancelot, to provide the muscle. For as you may know, I am sadly little more than a statesman. I am yours to command. With that, I unsheathed my twin blades and started our quest. We go into the Viper's Nest. Take care. I'll go on ahead and make sure the path is secure. For your own safety, try not to stray. Oh, do let me know if I can be of assistance. My lord, let's leave the fighting to the professionals, shall we? Oh, yes, of course. Well then, Sir Lancelot, do what you do best. What will we do? Let's search for another path. This mountain is vast. I doubt this is the only trail. That looks like a way forward. The footing seems a bit treacherous. Please watch your step. <laughs> Last of the monsters. What glorious form, Sir Lancelot! Uh, it is a pleasure to watch you work. <clears throat> if you're unhurt, my boy, we had better proceed. Huh! <laughs> 
Data. Too close. Up to these ranged pop doodles. Do be careful, Sir Lancelot. Don't worry. I'll close that distance in a heartbeat. <laughs> Is this a dead end? No. Look! A chest! Wait. This monster... Get behind me! A giant eyeball! I think I've read about this monster! Nazarbanju! Correct. Our crew has faced it once before. Ah, such daring dudes, brave Lancelot! Give me! What a fearsome spectacle! Terrifying beast! A single glance and I feel frozen solid! We'll see which is colder. Its gaze or my frost. safe now. One blade for truth, one for honor. Impressive! The Twin Fang Prodigy does not disappoint. Thank you, my lord. I hadn't done much during our climb. So the praise caught me unawares. Shall we check this chest? It could contain the record you seek. Yes? Let's see what she's holding. The young lord opened the box. A rather dry affair, as we already knew what to expect. And here it is! In his hands, he held a flaking tome, its pages warped and yellowed by age. This takes me back. Once upon a winter, I sought out that very book with Ludwin's father. And now it's been passed to me. But this... As Ludwin flitted through the pages, his face twisted into expressions of greater and greater perplexity. I can't read this at all! Is this some sort of code? I suppressed the urge to take a glance myself. My duty was to protect, not translate. In the end, it was Hans who broke the silence. If it pleases his lordship, shall I offer a hint? Ludwin shook his head. No, this is a trial that I must conquer myself. And on that note, I believe you are dismissed, Sir Lancelot. I thank you for your services today, and payment will be made forthwith. Understood. If ever you need my help again, do not hesitate to call. Thus, my private escort mission ended without much fanfare. And yet, I had a feeling that our paths would cross once again. At least, I hoped that they would. There was something about Ludwin, his earnestness perhaps, and his love for his comrades that resonated with me. We've received a special request. My premonition proved correct. His lordship finds himself in need of your assistance once more. Hans's voice was almost apologetic. What troubles him? 
You remember the record we found on our previous trek, don't you? I nodded. The Lord of Grosgard was searching for a family heirloom, and this record detailed its whereabouts. However, the directions were written in code, which Ludwin had yet to decipher. He told me, and I quote, Hans, don't you dare bother the charming and brave Lancelot over a mere trifle. But he hasn't made any headway on his own, and I've no doubt he's secretly yearning for your aid. I looked at the butler with some confusion. Hans, I recall you saying you'd already completed the trial with Ludwin's father. Indeed. Then your assistance would be far more valuable than mine. Come now, it is a butler's duty to serve his liege's best interests, and Lord Ludwin's shall be best served with my silence. I suppose Ludwin would never grow if Hans simply led him to the answers. Better that we pieced out the puzzle together. Very well. I accept your request. I thank you, on behalf of his lordship. Now I was beginning to grasp at the deeper meaning behind these tests. Hans took me to Grosgard. As an artist's soul is mirrored in their brushstrokes, so too is a lord's character reflected in the state of their dominion. Everywhere, you could see Ludwin's gentle touch. From the full fields, to the content faces of the farmers, to the laughter of children and adults alike that filled the air. What do you think of our humble land? I tore my eyes away from the bright orchards and turned to Hans. It's beautiful. It may not be large or bustling, but I've never been to such a peaceful dukedom. I'm sure his lordship will be pleased to hear that assessment. Suddenly, I found myself curious. Earlier, you said that the ancestral trials would teach Ludwin how to rule. But judging from what I've seen here, he is already a capable lord. What more would you like him to learn? Hans smiled tenderly, as a grandfather might when speaking of a beloved grandchild. I should have known an avid scholar like yourself would read between the lines. Make no mistake, Ludwin is not a perfect leader yet, but it is not my place to discuss his flaws. Then tell me this. Are his flaws related to his family's inability to fight? Let us call it a starting thread, but the full tapestry is so much more. I decided not to pry. I already had the information I needed to guide Ludwin through his trial. Sir Lancelot? I don't remember sending for you. Of course, the Lord was surprised to see me. Although friendly, I was a rogue element in a world where this man had control of nearly everything. I have come at the request of Hans. He would like me to assist you in deciphering the tome. I see. Hans does have a knack for meddling in his lord's affairs, but I welcome you all the same because, to tell the truth, I'm getting absolutely nowhere. I smiled despite myself. It was nice to meet a noble who wasn't spilling over with pride. Hans beckoned me to his desk, and I leaned over the old tome. What do you make of it? This must be child's play for a famed warrior scholar. He looked at me with expectant eyes. I'm sorry, but I can't decipher this. We will need to enlist the help of an expert. Expectation turned to astonishment. Lancelot, though you fight like a storm, your mind is as clear as the stillest of ponds. I can't believe you'd need to ask for assistance. Can't you? Every second I spend on the battlefield is a second away from the library. Ludwin hesitated a while longer, but when I strode to the door and held it open for him, he sighed and relented. No one in either of our circles was well-versed in ciphers, but that was a matter of small concern. 
I knew an information broker. Zothba put me in touch with a language scholar, who delivered a key to us within a fortnight. Well, I'll be. The clue was in the names of my ancestors. Ludwin stood up behind his desk and stretched, and the lines of care and worry melted from his face. He must have had many sleepless nights, poring over the withered pages of the tome alone. Thank you, Sir Lancelot. I can finally read the damn thing. It's only a matter of time now until I find the sword. It was my pleasure. I look forward to news of your success. But I already knew. Before the unearthing of the blade, Hans would come to visit me one last time. I was half right. It was not Hans, but Ludwin himself who showed up at our doorstep. I deciphered the record, and I know where the sword is buried. He was so excited, he completely forwent pleasantries. I know I should go alone, with Hans, of course, but the tome says we must fly to Skyworm Valley, which is riddled with monsters. It's a terrible place for a lord to be made into dragon kibble. I knew what he wanted me to say. Very well. Please, allow me to accompany you. Really? Wonderful! I mean, <clears throat> only if you wish. This must have been the flaw Hans was alluding to. Ludwin was afraid of his own power. He dreaded the responsibilities that came with leadership. The Lords of Grosgard were not warriors and hadn't been for generations. They depended on their subjects for protection. But as I'd learned, Ludwin was loath to do so. Up until now, this has not posed a problem. Small skirmishes were all that troubled the peace of his dukedom. But what would happen should a great war march on his borders? Would his honor eventually spur him to the front lines? To death? The place of a lord and general is with the rear guard. There, they must order the battle and conduct diplomatic affairs. But it is hard, sitting and conversing in safety while your soldiers are risking their lives. As captain of the White Dragons, I knew this better than anyone. You feel as if every death is on your head. At last, I have come to fully understand Ludwin. If these trials, as Hans said, could help him come into his own, then I would do everything in my power to guide him to victory. The day arrived. Ludwin, Hans, myself, and a few more compatriots met outside of Skyworm Valley. Lancelot, thank you for coming, but I wasn't aware there would be others with you. Who are these people? He looked with wide eyes at the rest of the crew, whom he had never met before. I have heard terrible monsters lurk in these parts. Alone, I would not have been able to guarantee your safety. These are my crewmates, each one a warrior of great strength and honor. Not that I don't appreciate their presence, but Sir Lancelot, surely a knight of your caliber could cut through these beasts with both hands tied behind your back. Chance, my lord, is as unpredictable as the weather. A wise skyfarer prays for a gentle current, but prepares for a vicious storm. Ludwin nodded thoughtfully. Very well. Best I leave the knighting to the knights.
The white dragon unfurls its wings. Come. Are you ready to begin the trial? It's now or never. Let go. Hey, look! The welcome squad! Her attacks aren't working! Is this part of the trial? Wait, I remember! The record said a single link does not a chain make. So fighting one at a time will work? Let's get it all at once! Very well. On Lancelot's mark. In position! You it's think working. Very clever, Vane. <laughs> Siegfried got the plan for silence. If not for Lord Ludwin's counsel, you would have been lost. You did it! You, you really years. did it! Still, you I only wish I'd have been me. of more use. Don't worry about it! We've all got stuff we're good and bad at. There is no shame in seeking help from others. It builds trust. Yes, trust. That is all we ask from you, Lord Ludwin. Looks like we've reached the second trial. There are so many spirits around. We'd best fight in formation. This may be similar to the previous trial. Thank you. Very well. Leave the vanguard to me. Into the front. We're gonna be so insane. Oh, wait, 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 wait. I'm about to see four legendary knights in battle at once. Keepers to behold. Let us carry this passion. I aim to smother it. Surrender. These blind attacks aren't working. We need to coordinate. Right. Superb teamwork. <laughs> cool. That was sweet. Now. Yeah. Oh, yeah. formation. I'll take care of this. A sublime combination. Mm. There's teamwork, that. baby. Stay. Yeah. Strike as one. They're not gonna like this. Proceed with caution. Roger that. Follow. Almost there missed. Rush. for the second trial. Never have I seen it too easy, sense. Lancelot? Not Quite at all. Good at covering We've only made tracks. smooth progress thanks to the team. We fought alongside each other for years. This was nothing. Is a dead soul given form by evil spirits. I you're dead? No, no, I never signed up to fight the dead! Retreat! Everyone! Remain calm. We can handle this. You can't know that for sure. The stars are small, but anything would have happened if you fight the fight. Weakness? My lord Ludwig, I ask that you listen to Lancelot. They shall trust in us. My noble guy! Lord Ludwig! Without powers combined, no force can stop us. Stay Here it comes! Whatever happens, I'll protect you! She will go through! Very well. Lancelot believed in this team, and so shall I. Now to the vanguard! I need backup! I'm 
here for you. I'll wait. 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 Stay focused. No further. Four balls left loose. Five. Let's go. I will be your guiding light. Over here. I'll cover you. Who's your dude? I'll take it from here. The chest awaits you, my lord. Open it and claim your prize. Ah, oh, yes. Of course. After this, it's back to training. After numerous trials, we arrived at last in front of a lone treasure chest. If it hadn't been for your help, Sir Lancelot, I wouldn't have made it this far. I fear I won't ever be able to repay this debt. There is no debt between us. But do not trouble yourself about me. Look now to your prize. With trembling hands, Ludwin undid the clasps of the chest and lifted from it a sheathed sword. A blade of my forebears. It's... Uh... Lighter than I thought it would be. Carefully, he drew forth the weapon. What's the meaning of this? It's just a hilt! Ludwin was the very picture of distress. But I saw through the riddle at once. A sword with no blade. A weapon that could neither defend nor slay. It was a message left by the first lords of Grosgard for their scions. Gently, I cleared my throat. Perhaps, my lord, it was meant to be a hilt, and a hilt alone. What? Why would my ancestors bequeath unto me a hunk of metal? You will find the answer to this puzzle, as you have to all the others. Slowly, Ludwin's grip on the blade relaxed, and he began to turn it over in his hands. <sighs> Fine. I'll... Give it a bit more thought. Sir Lancelot, do you really think his lordship will be able to figure it out? On our way back, Hans fell in beside me to take whispered counsel. What does your heart tell you? You have been at his side all these years. Hans made no reply, but I saw the shadow pass from his face and a soft light come into his eyes. We've received a special request.
The third day after we had returned, Ludwin came calling. I've got it! The meaning behind our family heirloom! With great reverence, he laid his hand on the hilt, which was sheathed at his hip. At last, the pieces of the puzzle are gathered and the picture is whole. The tome in the mountains, the message in code, the chest guarded by monsters, and the sword without a blade. Ludwin laughed dryly. Sir Lancelot, I love this land, passed down to me by my forebears. I love its gentle rills, its rolling hills, its honest laborers, and its noble warriors. I would do anything to keep them from harm. But he could not fight his own battles. He spoke of one such conflict that occurred within his dukedom. He was forced to flee to safer grounds, while the blood of his people mingled with the dirt. The guilt ever gnawed at him, robbing him of his happiness and repose. In the midst of his troubles, Hans told him of a legendary blade. The young lord grew convinced that this sword would bestow upon him the strength he needed to protect his own. I wanted to be everything for my people. A great warrior like you, and also a wise general and a benevolent lord. But now I see that one person does not make a country. I am the hilt which guides the sword. And the people are the blade, which are its strength, leader and follower. One is lost without the other. Emotion stirred within me, and I drew a trembling breath. My lord, we are more alike than you think. There was a time when I blamed myself every time I lost a knight. I tried to shoulder the burdens of my kingdom alone, thinking I was protecting everyone. But I was wrong, for my fall would have meant the ruin of all. Ludwin nodded. You're right. I'm done tearing myself into pieces, trying to play a hundred roles at once. My people are counting on me to guide them, and so I shall, with this sword. He drew the hilt from its sheath. Look to your own duties, and trust your comrades to fulfill theirs. That is all we can do. I won't ever forget this lesson, Sir Lancelot. I swear upon my ancestors that from this hour henceforth, I shall dedicate myself to becoming the fair and wise lord that Grosgard deserves. The clouds of doubt were gone from Ludwin's eyes. He had found his path at last. And I had been reminded of something important. It was true that leadership and responsibility acted as shackles, but they were also anchors, providing safety and stability on a sea of uncertainty. Months later, word reached me concerning a Lord Ludwin of Grosgard. It was said he had no great strength of arms, but his wit and will were edged sharper than steel. Under his rule, the people lived in peace, and their fields were ever gold. But the young lord never accepted praise for his deeds. He always spoke of the loyalty of his subjects and the wisdom of a foreign knight. It seems his idolatry of me still hasn't changed. But as Ludwin has grown into his title, perhaps I too should learn to bear my mantle with pride. I am Lancelot. Captain of the White Dragons, and son of Beedrock. All right, see you.
We've received a special request. The roar of fire, a cry of pain. Before me, the hewn carcass of a monster, yet smoking. I smothered the pity arising in my heart, for I knew that to let the beast live was to let others die. I long for days when I need not draw my blade. They say the skies are endless, yet I have not seen any part of it unclouded by monsters or raging primals, but the drums of war did not roll like thunder, nor have I discovered any path to order that was not carved out with swords. Though I joined the crew to found the Halcyon country of my dreams, our journeys have taught me to fear my quest is only that, a dream. For we live in a time when all things are driven by violence. And yet, who knows? what lies just beyond the horizon. The captain said we would sail for a new Skydom tomorrow. For once, may we alight upon shores of unbroken peace. The House of Wales had three sons, bound as much by love as they were by blood. The eldest was named Aglavale, the next, Lamorak, and the youngest, Percival. I had not yet seen many summers when war broke out in the neighboring country, raising a tempest of violence that would blow us all asunder. My mother, the Queen Hartzeloida, opened the gates of our castle to all who had lost their homes. Even those hailing from beyond the borders of our kingdom, she would often say. Regardless of our lineage or nation, we are all connected, in joy and in sorrow. It was through her example that we learned to honor our neighbors. And yet the same people she gave generously to would be the very ones to take her life. I will never forget the scene of her death. I can yet hear the echoes of Aglavale's curses. See the stark white of Lamorak's face as his magic failed to save the one thing he treasured most. And I can feel the warmth leaving my mother's hand as I knelt over her, unable to offer anything but my tears. To the very end, all her thoughts and worries were for us. How can an absence feel so heavy? What heart, having borne the weight of grief, will not be changed forever? For my part, I grew to despise the violence that robbed me of my family. I swore I would raise a new kingdom, above the tides of blood, where the gentle gardener and the honest plowman may live out their days in peace. The same grief, however, bent Aglavale on a different path. Believing he could conquer tragedy and banish it from our lands, he began amassing great power. But where power treads, war soon follows. It is custom for the sons of our house to serve as knights in foreign countries, thereby learning the ways of the world. I went to Fiendrock, an ally of Wales, and there joined the Black Dragons, in time becoming vice-captain. Fiendrock made no distinction between me and its native-born children, and I grew to see it as my second home. But no sea is so placid that storms do not brew. There was strife here, too, sweeping over the lands like an illness. I set out on a journey to seek its cure, 
And that was how I met the captain. Never had I come across a greater fool. In the captain's eyes, there was no sky dweller too high or low to meridate. No person too strong or weak to join the crew. Who better then to stand by me as I built a kingdom on an impossible dream? And it was not I, nor Lancelot, nor Vane, nor my former commander Siegfried, but the captain who contributed most to the restoration of Fiendrock. Once the dust settled, we found traces of a foreign power that had first sown the seeds of unrest. We tracked this power back to Wales and its throne room, where my brother Aglavale sat. Still mourning for our mother, he was waging a war on war, murdering tragedy and washing away tears with blood. But one cannot fight fire with fire. For what beauty will bloom from the ashes? Once again, I borrowed the aid of the captain to stop my brother's rampage and help him see reason. Though Aglavale's deeds were wrong, they came from a desire to do good. It is a simple matter to speak words of censure. The wise guide others not through saying, but through doing. Thus, I shall build my country and show my brother it is not the flames of war, but the gentle hearth fire that will guide us to peace. Each day brings me nearer to my aim. Fortune has granted me a handful of stout-hearted vassals, the captain foremost among them. Though I am not possessed of any land, our ship is bound for the end of the skies. Surely, we will sail over some quiet green fields where I may lay the cornerstone of my kingdom. My greatest care is the safety of the crew. The path of the Grand Cipher is beset by many perils, and I will not have a single vassal taken from me. So I have resolved to travel alongside and defend my captain. Until the day I may sheath my sword forevermore. With each sky to my visit, I survey both the lands and the people, hoping to extract the worthiest hearts as vassals for my own kingdom. To that end, I return to Fulca, the first settlement we came upon in Zega Grande. But though the earth is ever filled with rich soil and strong rock, true gems are few and far between. So too are the noblest spirits. The people of Fulca were of a good but common sort, who preferred constancy to change. They had no army, and peace in the city was kept by a band of volunteers. But if there is one thing I have learned from the captain and crew, it is that wisdom and strength often reside in the unlikeliest of places. Thus I sought out the Fulcan Defense Corps, hoping to find a diamond in the rough. The city folk, however, express little faith in their guards. The Defense Corps? <laughs> Full of bums who got more stomach for eating than fighting. <laughs> Better off calling them the Defense Corpses for the fat lot of help they are. Yet these were dangerous times for Folka. Brigands and monsters now swarmed about the city, attracted like flies to the reek of Avia. The people looked to the Defense Corps for protection, but received only excuses. We don't have the resources to combat this threat. Take shelter until the danger is past. And so the city grew to trust vagabond Skyfarers more than their own soldiers. Though I had little hope of finding a vassal among this ragged band, Perhaps there was a lesson to be learned from their weakness. When I build my kingdom, it will need to be governed by its own councils. But houses of power, choked by the vines of corruption and frailty, ever fall into decay. Is there any prevention? Where does the first crack form? It was in Folka 
that I would piece out the answer to this riddle. My road to the Defense Corps was short, but troubled. This world is being drowned in tears of suffering! Poor wretches, join us on the Ship of Salvation and sail to the island of Estelusia! It began when I happened upon a man in the city streets, preaching the creed of Avia. Though we had overthrown the main body of the church at Seed Hollow Castle, still its teachings lived on. Its adherents once numbered in the thousands, and the remnants yet drifted through the skies like ghosts. Now they haunted Folka, hoping to once again breathe life into their crusade. But the city folk had learned that Avia would sacrifice anything on the altar of salvation. Their gilded words held no more value. Get out of here! We know what you did at Seed Hollow! We aren't inviting tragedy into our city! Leave! As the throng railed, unease stirred within me. The adherents of Avia would march on an armed country if their leader so much as waved her hand. What could heated words do but spark their anger? I came to offer you salvation! If you won't drink from the cup of mercy, you will taste divine retribution! Voices soared and the air grew heavy with the threat of violence. Yet the Defense Corps, who were charged with keeping the peace, did not appear. You there, tell me. I asked a man why mediators had failed to come. I'd be surprised if they did show. Without Mr. Fixit to help them, bastards can't even wipe their own asses. Though I had expected it, seeing the proof of their cowardice still astonished me. Silence! Now it's clear. We want to break in your minds. First, we've got to break in your bodies. What are you doing? Let go of me! An Avieth Crusader, lifting an Islander by his collar, raised up a fist. But I seized his arm before the blow could land. Strike him, and you will lose that hand. I would not suffer the defenseless to be oppressed. You miscreant! How dare you threaten a member of the church! You speak of threats. You would force your doctrine on the unwilling with an iron fist. The time of Avia is over, preacher. Your false church is no more. Blasphemy! We'll have your tongue for that! Avieth soldiers surrounded me, drawing their weapons. I had hoped you would listen to reason. But now I see, you only understand pain. With the hand on the hilt of my sword, I waited for them to attack. But like craven dogs that bark loudest when their quarry is far ahead, the Crusaders stopped short when I stood to face them. After sharing some whispered counsel with his fellows, the preacher said to me, We won't fight you in the city. No. Too much hassle cleaning you off the flagstones. Let's step outside, and then we'll see if that bulky armor is compensating for something. I could not hold back a laugh. Their intent was as clear as day. They meant to draw me into an ambush. Very well. I will play your game. We'll wipe that smirk off your face. Just you wait. The Crusaders and I turned to leave. He's going to get himself killed! Call the Defense Corps! Even those worms should be able to do something! Frighted voices whirled behind me. I did not quiet them, for though 3,000 ants of Avia could not crush one lion of Wales, I saw a chance to further test the core. Hmm. 
set out. Death to all who interfere with Avia's sacred mission! And you have abandoned mercy for violence and wisdom for bigotry. How dare you call your cause sacred? A demon! Some evil must be you feeding his brain! Call for backup! Tell them to bring the droid up! He's just one worm! Why can't we crush him? Strength of will is reflected in strength of arms. Good. Summon all your forces. It will save me the trouble of seeking them out. Reporting for duty. <laughs> You're finished now, interloper! <laughs> that hubris will be your downfall. <laughs> ashes to ashes! Succumb to fear. <laughs> It is strange. Though a great battle rages on their doorstep, the core do not appear. Do they sleep? My poor brethren. You won't like what's coming to you, interloper. It's Brother Avalon. The redhead's done for. Drag them back. On your Back to the boy. To the fire. You can't. It's over. Make your doom! Wait. I know you. The Lord of Flames. I see my name has reached even the dregs of Zega Grande. His fire is the fire of hell. Slink back to your holes. Damn you! Damn you to the bottom of the skies! The Crusaders took quickly to their heels. The weakest dogs bark the loudest. I sheathed my sword, judging pursuit to be a waste of time. I doubted the cowards would ever return. There's one over there! Alerted by a voice, I looked up to see a group of soldiers hurrying towards me. Their livery was not of Avia, and they carried their weapons with the grace of a schoolboy wielding his first quill. I had a good guess of who they were. After they had ringed me about with spear points and blades, one cried, No funny moves, or we'll skewer you like a pig! Who are you, and what business do you have with me? Of course you don't recognize us, or you'd be shaking in your fancy boots. Listen up, I'm Douglas, captain of the Falcon Defense Corps. You one of the Avia rats that raised hell in our city? Better come quietly, or you'll be sorry. For a moment, amazement wrested from me the power of speech. Then I said... Surely you do not believe I am a servant of Avia. Don't play dumb. Who else would wear that tacky armor? What did you call my armor? I had always known my garb to be striking. So is the livery of all great kings and lords. For on the midnight field of battle, the general must ever be the brightest star. Thus may he enkindle courage in friends and show the enemy he is not afraid. My own armor was well-worn, and had shielded me from many dangers. To speak ill of it was a grave affront. We're taking you back to the station, and don't even think about running. <laughs> What's so funny? Nothing. Nothing at all. 
In truth, this was a matter more to weep than to laugh at. The proud guards of Fulka, arriving like carrion crows after the battle to pick at what spoils they may. It was a pitiful sight. Defense corpses, indeed. Do what you will. And so I was marched back to the city. We've received a special request. The Defense Corps questioned me at their guardhouse. An enlightening experience, as I had never been a prisoner before. All right, Fessa. Tell me exactly how you're connected to the Church of Avia. I repelled a group of crusaders that threatened your people. You had no right to apprehend me. Sh shut your mouth! That was all Captain Douglas could stutter out before retreating into silence. Hm. Has guilt caught your tongue? I know your actions weigh on your conscience. If you're trying to scare me, Mr. High and Mighty, I am trying to help you. Now take heed. As keepers of peace, you are given the authority to take prisoners. But it is not a power to be used lightly. For to imprison someone is to rob them of time, and not all the riches in the world can repay that debt. I went on with hardly a pause. Today you failed your duty. You did not come when your people were in peril. Had I not been there, blood would have been spilled in your streets. And yet you seized me on sight like a petty thief, with no proof other than your own prejudices. I let my final words fall like the stroke of a hammer. You have dishonored your titles and your city. Color fled from the soldiers' faces, leaving only remorse. Hey, Captain! I think he might be right. We did kind of arrest him for just being there and wearing tacky armor. Don't let him get to you! Now the soldiers began to contend amongst themselves. They had to keep quiet about my capture, said one, or there could be trouble. If only they had not delayed after hearing reports of violence, said another. It was good fortune, countered a third, that they had not run into Avia. So on and on they argued in circles, aimless, like a dog chasing its tail. Until at last, Douglas, his impatience boiling over, burst forth with... All right, fine. Fancy pants, you're acquitted. Now scram! No. Seeing the soldiers at a loss, I said. Since you have taken my time, I now ask you to share some of yours. I hear that your ranks are corrupted with frailty and disorder. From whence did this rot first spread? Why should we tell you, huh? You got nothing to do with it. Because I desire and command it. For a moment, Douglas could only stare. Come on, Captain. Just give him what he wants. Yeah, I don't think this guy takes no for an answer. Okay, Rublox, you win. Now pipe down and listen up. And so the captain and soldiers of the Corps told me of their history and their malcontent. After the war, Zega Grande was left undisturbed for 500 years. This peace, like a deep sleep, had dulled the minds and limbs of Volka's warriors. So when the Crusades of Avia roused them at last. They were found weak and unready. Still, we did all right in the beginning. You probably don't know him, but we used to have a Mr. Fixit in the city. Went by the name of Roland? Angel of a man, but he fought like a demon. The strength of Roland was their fortress, to which the Corps could rally if the battle went ill. 
when he vanished. The soldiers were left without their greatest defense. So, there we were, a group of idiots who could barely tell the butt of a spear from its head. Left to play this game of cat and mouse. Self-loathing seeped into Douglas's voice. I know what everyone thinks of us. I know what they call us. But do you think we're wimps because we want to be? Now that Roland's gone, sending my corps to war, a, a real war, would be sending my brothers and sisters to death. Captain Douglas, you've been trying to protect us this whole time? I sighed. Why do the best intentions so often lead us astray? Very well. For your sakes and mine, I will help the Corps regain its former glory. Maybe by rebuilding this fallen band, I would learn a lesson in how to lay the foundations for a kingdom. The next morning, I paid a visit to the Defense Corps headquarters. I did not receive a cordial welcome. You're that redhead. Why'd you come back here? To supply you with counsel. Now hearken to me. The soldiers could only look on in wonder as I continued. Order is the basis of any kingdom, great or small. It is what establishes harmony in music and builds peace out of strife. You are its keepers and conductors. Take pride in your duty. To this, the soldiers could find no response. I went on. You told me you cannot fight because Roland is gone. You are mistaken. Comrades give you courage, but true strength must come from within. You cannot fight because you are weak. There followed a moment of silence. Then the core encircled me. We didn't ask for your advice. Grab him! Throw him out! But I fixed them with a look. I have said nothing you did not already know. If you can see your faults, why not mend them? Begin by overseeing your daily tasks, for habit is the mother of success and failure. That's it! You won't shut up? Then we'll make you! I evaded the soldier's blow with a step. Raising my fist in the air, I said. Wielding force to stifle dissent. Already you overstep your power. But I will not be silenced so easily. In one wave, the whole core rushed upon me, but they were like water breaking upon rock. I showed them mercy. So when it was over, their pride smarted more than their flesh. Who the hell are you? Only a passing Skyfarer. Tell me, Captain Douglas, are you ashamed you could not lead your forces to victory against one man? All right, Rubalox, if you're so smart, why don't you try being captain? See how hard it is to train a bunch of bumpkins. There is no metal so firm it cannot be wrought. Very well, then. Lend me your title, and I will show you how warriors are forged. Huh? And so I became the one-time captain of the Corps. Training began the following day. Arms maintenance, proper stance, they had no knowledge of even these rudimentary things. I was reminded of my days as a squire, when I was first initiated in the art of war. Of course, I was met with some resistance. There was talk of banishing me from Fulka. Yet not a soldier abandoned their training. I saw that though they lacked discipline, their hearts were in the right place. As long as they loved their city, I would grant them the strength and knowledge to protect it. Often while they honed their bodies in the field, I gave speeches to reform them in spirit. When you hear of trouble, act swiftly. But above all, seek to prevent. Every drop of blood is a loss. The wise win wars before the first blow is struck. Take censure, 
but reserve judgment. Focus on bettering yourself, for the only actions you can control are your own. Always be ready to defend your people. Though peace may reign within your borders, there is no telling what perils lurk without. Within days, a new luster could be seen in the soldiers' eyes, and all talk of my banishment had faded. The training of the Defense Corps proceeded smoothly. I guess you know what you're doing. All right, Rubilox. You can run this outfit a little longer. Though they barked and whined, former Captain Douglas and his soldiers endured my training. The time had come for Fulka to see them reborn. I proposed a patrol, the foremost duty of a guard, for evil Infirm of purpose, dares not stir beneath a watchful eye. That's a bad idea. I looked sharply at Douglas, who paced back and forth. Why do you waver? Why do you think? We've been losers our whole lives. We can't go out there now and, and dance around the place like we own it. They're gonna laugh at us. As a soldier, you must not weigh pride against duty. Now, this is a direct order from your captain. Move out. All came to pass as Douglas feared. In the streets of the city, children pointed, men jeered, and women laughed. Behind me, I could feel the will of my band weakening. Do not falter. Remember, shame should not hinder, but rather drive you to do good. The eye sees only the present, and the past is soon forgotten. There was no more I could do for them. The Corps would have to reclaim their own honor. I led them on without another backward glance. Hey, look! It's the March of the Freeloaders! Must be nice getting paid to take a little stroll! These barbed words were slung at us before the tavern. The speaker was a red-faced man. No doubt set on by excessive wine. I slowed my pace. It was true that the Corps had brought this scorn upon their heads. Yet what remedy could poisoned tongues offer? I never intended for them to be thus reviled. Turning, I walked up to the drunkard. You, you got a problem, big guy? The man shook in fear. But I did no more than bow to him. Forgive us. It is the part of a leader to bear the faults of his followers. For who will answer to a lord that will not answer for them? I am now the captain of the Corps, and speak on their behalf. We have failed you in the past. For that, we are sorry. But these soldiers are now changed. Give us time and I swear on my honor we will set things right. Amazement flashed into the man's eyes, clearing the fog of drunkenness. Shamefaced, he hurried away. I, um, wanted to apologize, Captain Percival. Douglas's voice sounded behind me. It's our fault you had to grovel to a juice head like that. Enough. I held up a hand. Power is ever conjoined with responsibility. I did no more than duty commanded. Now come. The day wears on. It is time for training. At the guardhouse, the men fell to their drills with vigor. Put your back into your swings! Stand firm! You are the first defense of your people. Bear yourselves with pride! Yes, sir! Their voices were clear, and their movements strong. Soon, I thought, they would be a match even for the forces of Avia.
Bad news! Those Avia rats are back! The day that would test the valor of the Corps came sooner than expected. I looked up at the soldier, who had burst breathless into the guardhouse. Report! An armed group thought to be connected with Avia is occupying the mines of Tempil. They've taken the reconstruction workers captive, including several residents of Folka. It would be a dangerous rescue for the Corps, who were yet untried in combat. But the soldiers quickly showed me they had not failed their training. Captain Percival, let's fight back! We're ready! We can save those hostages! No. I sensed something strange at work. It had been the aim of the ruined church to bolster their ranks with new converts from Folka. Why then would they occupy their minds and threaten their people? Surely it was not for ransom. The adherents of Avia held their faith high above the jewels of the earth. This had to be a trap. Of course, trap or no, the Corps could easily overthrow Avia, as long as I led them. But I could not stay in Folka forever. And so I said, Do not let confidence consume your wisdom. Your duty is to protect your people, not to prove your strength. You do not know the designs of your enemy, nor whether your might can contend with theirs. You must call for aid. I saw that my warning had disheartened the soldiers. I could not blame them. They had struggled so far, only to learn that they still fell short. But glory must not be bought with blood. The lives of the islanders came first. Drawing myself up, I strove to lift their spirits. Your city needs you. There is much work to be done. Learn what you can from those that escaped the mines. Muster the defenses. Let your people know they are safe. Yes, sir! But Captain Percival, the clock is ticking. What if the Skyfarers and reinforcements from Seed Hollow don't make it in time? I could not hold back a smile. Do not worry. I know a crew of Skyfarers already at hand. First, to secure the hostages. Wait! That hair! It's the rooster head from Volca! To arms, brethren! Sentries, you will wish you never saw them. Okay. Nice faint. Where do you learn to fight? Uniel was my mentor, and virtue by me. It's over! Forward! Under must be more of them. Let's see which of our spirits burns the brighter. Challenge accepted. How'd you get in here? Where the lookout? Leap on the job? You'll never know. Ready? Too few of them. Their main force must be headed for Polka. Perhaps I should turn back. No. I must have faith in my comrades. All the hostages are behind bars. At least they will be kept safe from the battle. You may know me as the Lord of Flames. Are you here to save us? The Lord? It's the men Brother Avalon warned us about! So we meet again, Lord But unfortunately, you! This battle may go like the last water! Not many who survived my flames dare to face them again. You are either brave or a fool. Wide open. Into the, Into the fray. War's not one. Blessing from your lord. We must have lost no your place. Oh, the moment I can't believe it. They're winning a hundred to one. How? Have the stars forsaken us? The stars do not decide our fate. We do. 
been turning to treachery and force. You built your own tomb. Will somebody please silence this man? You pressed to fire. A lovely opening up to the fall of Volka. That's right. Sir Knight, you have to go back to Volka. Volka is in safe hands. It will take more time to bind these Crusaders than it did to defeat them. I bound the hands of the Crusaders and turned them captive toward Folka. <laughs> Why, here's a stalwart little interloper. You could do far better than Skyfaring, you know. Keep silent. I will not listen to the lies of a false prophet. Then I guess you won't believe me when I say the mines were just a diversion. We sent our main force to Folka. They'll have captured the city by now. We'll raise it to the ground and build a new church of Avi on the smoking ruins. The preacher continued to lay bare his plot, though I had no desire to hear it. I know this backcountry is filled with scurrying field mice. You skyfarers were the only real threat. If we could keep you busy elsewhere, say, in some nice, dusty mines, then taking Foka would be like stealing candy from a baby. Even now, you know not of what you speak. I had already made out that the mines were not your true purpose. And you misjudge the people of Volka. There is great strength in that city. It will not fall to the likes of you. That's... that's hogwash! If you will not trust my words, then perhaps you will trust your eyes. We had come to the gate of Volka. Captain Percival, we've captured all the invaders. You should have seen us, Captain. No one messes with us on our turf. There, trussed up before the city walls, were the remaining Crusaders of Avia. The soldiers of the Corps stood over them, bloody but triumphant. And the air was bright and filled with rejoicing as the people of Volka cried glory unto their defenders. How could country mice have overthrown the High Hogs of Avia? With that, the preacher fell to his knees and spoke no more. We've received a special request. Several days later, I walked into the guardhouse, for what would be the last time. The captain's here! Attention! In a moment, the soldiers were lined up before me. At ease. My friends, you have found your strength and your courage. The time has come for me to step down as your captain. With the space of a deep breath, the soldiers did not stir. I read in their eyes that they had long seen this day coming. Captain Percival, we... That title is no longer mine. I return it to you, Captain Douglas. You have become a worthy leader. I turned back toward the body of the Corps. I am but a traveler. My allegiance lies with a distant country, a kingdom of peace that I shall one day build. But I believe that all who dwell in the skies are brothers and sisters. Though our time together was short, it was an honor to serve with you. You have shown that we need not be chained to our pasts. That valor can be kindled in every heart. When I raise my kingdom, I hope that you will one day visit to impart this lesson unto the knights there. Cap- no, Sir Percival. You can count on me. Me too! It's a promise! Mirth welled up within me. 
In one thing I thought, the core had not changed. They could still make me laugh. <laughs> Very well. I will hold you to those oaths. And so, bidding my friends farewell, I took once more to the skies. It was many months before I could return to Folka. This city is still the same. A gentle breeze danced with the grass. Sunlight streamed from between the leaves of trees, paving the streets in green and gold. But snakes dwell even in the quietest of gardens. Peace presided over this land only because there was a valiant corps to keep it. I was once captain of the Falcon Defense Corps, and though our paths led on to different ends, they would ever be my friends and comrades. In my heart, I saluted them. Wait, aren't you... Well met. I was not surprised we crossed paths. Fulka was a small city, and I knew the Defense Corps kept vigilant watch. I am glad to see you doing well. We sure are. We even got a generation of new recruits trained up. So, when do you think you'll be inviting us to your kingdom? I responded with a wry smile. It will be some time yet, but I shall not rest unless it be in a country of peace. Until that day, wait here, and serve your city well. You're gonna make it, Percival. I just know it. In the meantime, I better practice my curtsy, huh? I regarded Captain Douglas and his corps. Here were soldiers that had once lived in shame. But courage had been kindled in their hearts, and like candles they now passed its light to others. So does one good turn give rise to another, and valor begets valor. Perhaps the rise of my kingdom was not so far off after all. We've received a special request. I can no longer recall when I first met the captain. All I can say is our paths crossed in dark times, when nights were sleepless and the wind whispered with insidious intent. Fiendrock, my homeland, was crumbling from within, consumed by the weakness of her own people. I ventured abroad to seek help from our neighbors, but this rendered me blind to schemes hatched in the heart of our court. When I returned, the adders sprung, and I found myself falsely convicted of regicide. Disgraced, I fled the kingdom, and wandered for a while in the pathless wild. Perhaps I would still be there, slowly fading into the shadow, had the crew of the Grand Cipher not come for me. The captain never once doubted my innocence, led me back to Fiendrock, and cleared my name. My honor was restored. Thus concluded the greater part of my tale, but the Grand Cipher's myth was just beginning. I joined the crew to see this story unfurl. Our journey, like all great journeys, has passed through both sorrow and joy. We have traversed the wilds, crossed kingdoms forgotten, 
and met all sorts of folk. I've always found the meeting of people to be miraculous. Throughout the course of history and on into the future, there have been and will be at least as many people as stars in the sky. For any two souls to come together is as wondrous as looking up into the night and seeing your image set against the velvet and winking lights. I do not know if it was fate that brought me and the captain together, but I do know I will never meet such a person again. I intend to sail with the crew to whatever end, even to the bottom of the skies. In my youth, I was vain and headstrong. I shunned the company of others, hurting all who came near me. If I had continued on that path, it's likely I would have died alone, with no one to mourn my loss. But that was not to be. I was discovered by Yosef, the former king of Fiendrock, found quite literally by the side of the road. Though at that time, I slew monsters solely out of malice. His Majesty looked at my blade and saw what took life could also save it. He knighted me, and under his guidance, I learned about honor and friendship. I found meaning in existence. But in our world, love is inextricable from grief. New friends and brothers were lost. People that I trusted turned upon me. Loyalty had imbued me with pride. But now, it taught me desperation. Once this desperation drove me to drink the blood of a dragon. This isn't to say that I regret becoming a knight. Lancelot, Vane, Percival, the friendship of those three alone is worth any price. I learned the greatest lesson of all from them, that no matter how much is lost, we may always find hope in younger generations. They are what we must fight to defend. They are our purpose. And to think all this was set into motion by a single meeting on the side of the road. As I grow older, it becomes clear how much I owe to King Yosef. But I shall never be able to thank him in person again. That is why I swore to repay him in the only way I know how. By dedicating what is left of my life to the future of his country. I know King Yosef would not want me to grieve overly much for him, but he turned me from a vagabond into the captain of the Black Dragon Knights. Under his rule, the base were ennobled, tall towers were raised, and withered fields burst forth into color. He might have done much more, had traitorous hands not cut his life short. The royal consul Isabella Covetous of his power, killed the king, and smeared the guilt of it on me. Unable to prove my innocence, I was forced to flee the capital. For weeks, I was hunted by soldiers I had trained by my own hand. Lancelot, foremost among them. My name was now reviled, scrubbed like a stain from the halls of honor. But this caused me little pain, for I never hungered after fame or titles. I served the crown because I loved my country, the same reason for which King Yosef wore it. Even as his body was broken and he lay on the threshold of death, he called only for the mending of Fiendrock. I would not let our home waste away under the shadow of Isabella's ambition. 
I returned to the marches, where I dwelled in secret, gathering information. I worked alone, and even Lancelot was kept from my counsels. I did not tell him of my innocence, nor why I sought to cut out the now festering heart of our court. My silence was not due to a lack of trust. It would have been impossible for me to reach Lancelot unseen. Any attempt at communication would likely have ended with my arrest. But even had there been a clear path to Lancelot, I would have kept to myself. Lancelot was, and is, still young. And young minds are easily molded. If I was to leave the protection of the kingdom to him, I needed to be sure that he was more than just clay. That he had an uncorruptible, ironclad core. I needed to be sure he was not the type to blindly follow orders. Or emotions. He wavered, as we all do. But fortunately, he was not alone. He had the support of his childhood friend, Vane, and of the Grand Cipher's captain. They were his light, an anchor, and with their help, Lancelot navigated the swirling tides of intrigue and arrived at the shores of truth. They were thus reunited, and together delivered Fiendrock from Isabella's clutches. I had fulfilled King Yosef's last wish, and Lancelot had come into his own. It was time for me to step down and place the country in the hands of the young. And so it was that I put the rolling hills and bright walls of my home behind me and embarked on a journey of discovery across the skies. Zega Grande, another new skydom where the clouds hid unfamiliar tales. My travels aboard the Grand Cipher have taken me to many far-flung places, where I have found that there is yet enchantment in this world. I've sought after magical seashells with the power to heal kingdoms. I've crossed blades with legendary warriors, and I've heard strains of alien music which, though strange to my ears, still spoke to my heart. But no matter how far I roam, my thoughts are constantly with the country King Yosef left in my keeping. When we alight in a foreign land, I find myself drawn not to gardens or taverns, but to places of law and order. I am ever seeking new allies for Fiendrock, and rooting out her enemies. <sighs> it must seem like I have a mind of cold iron and steel, and driven by thoughts of politics and war. And I have no excuse except to say, once a night, always a night. Zega Grande had almost fallen under the sway of Avia. Now, as its people rebuilt, I desired to learn whether their fortresses were stronger, and whether any dark shadows still haunted their streets. What you doing, Siegfried? Vern appeared at my shoulder one day as I was walking through Seed Hollow. I'm gathering intelligence. The dragon wrinkled his snout. Man, you're a workaholic. He wasn't incorrect. I did want to lay aside responsibility and stroll unburdened in the sun. But I couldn't rest easily when duty called. 
if I help. Two weeks are better than none. Hmm. Vern was indeed light and fast, but I found it easier to scout alone. Ugh, come on! I know how to handle myself! You certainly do. If anything, I felt that the Captain, Lyria, and Vern were strong beyond their years. That they had been forced to grow up too fast. All right, Vern. Be my guest. Finally! Something to do! Agent Vern is on the job! Vern twirls deftly in the air. So, uh, what exactly is the job? What kind of intelligence you looking for? It's a little abstract. I would like to learn about the values of this country. Why it was founded, for example. Or what would cause its people to go to war. For nations with similar values are often quick allies. But nations with conflicting values find themselves enemies. Yeah, I'm totally following. Er, take Fiendrock, for example. Our king and people stand for fellowship and peace. If we were to find out that the leaders of Seed Hollow, on the other hand, favored conquest and power, then we might expect trouble. What uh, kind of trouble are we talking here? Don't worry. I gave Vern what I hoped was a reassuring smile. I am not here to conduct a coup. I only seek information to bring back to Fiendrock, which may help in matters of diplomacy. Diplomacy? Well, that's way above my pay grade. Aw, oh, dude, I think something just happened over by the gate. I see a bunch of soldiers running that way. With two flaps of his wings, Vern lifted himself higher into the air and hovered, squinting against the glare of the sun. Seed Hollow's military force. This may be worth looking into. Come. Right behind you. A group of onlookers had gathered by the gate, speaking in loud, excited voices. A monster hunt, huh? Let us follow them. We may learn something useful. Nothing is so revealing of a person's nature as their deeds in battle. We passed out of the stone city and trudged for a while among grass and dirt paths. Or rather, I did, while Vern rode the winds beside me. Suddenly, he let himself rise on an updraft. Spotted him! They're going at it! As he spoke, I became aware of distant cries and the clash of arms. Let's see here. I crept beneath the shadow of dappling leaves and up a small knoll for a better look. I don't think they can win this thing! The warriors of Seed Hollow were many, and their faces grim with determination. And yet... Ah! Captain, we can't hold out much longer! Stand your ground! If these monsters get past us, it's the lives of your friends and family! They were scattered, weak, and on the brink of disaster. Vern, I'm going to their aid. With that, I grasped the hilt of my sword and burst from the cover of the trees. We gotta hold on! They're moments away from annihilation. We must leap down and ambush the goblins. God, come and face me! What the hell are you? Get out of here! This is no place for civilians! With all due respect, you are not in a position to reject my aid. Focus on keeping yourself safe. Ah, all right, fine. That sword of yours better not just be for show. How is he mowing down all these half feet? Stay the course! Stand strong! He's dancing circles around the half-beasts. Yeah, I can see that. Stop gawking and tend to the wounded. We're gonna make it. Heads up! Got monsters coming in from above! Screw! 
good hit. The next wave is coming. Quickly, get to safety. Oh, bad news. Goblin soldier marching this way. There's no way he can handle that alone. Who's still got juice in them? Back into the fray. No, stay put. We'll not be able to win with you as a burden. safe now i can't believe my eyes is that guy really human we could have handled them alone you know we could have think of how hard we've trained the cry of the last monster faded to nothingness and i sheathed my sword Oh, man. They're lucky we got here in the nick of time. Danger averted, Vern drifted to my side. <sighs> well met, Skyfarers. The soldiers from Seed Hollow gathered themselves and limped to form ranks. At their head, a man I believed was their captain stood, frowning at us. <laughs> you guys must be dying to thank us. I take payment in apples, by the way. Vern wasn't quite reading the mood. So you know your way around a sword. Great. We appreciate the help and all, but could you not interfere with official military business? What? We are professional soldiers. We can handle monsters without you swinging in to save the day. Number one? That's a lie! Number two, what's with the attitude? That's enough, Vern. The dragon looked ready to spout fire. Hoping to calm him, I caught him and held him in my arms. I'm sorry. We mean no disrespect. With a bow, I turned and left that shadowy glade. I did not relax my grip on Vern because I felt certain that if I let go, he would flip back and spit venom in the soldiers' faces. We've received a special request. What was wrong with them? They would have been toast without you! Vern flew beside me, seething. We are strangers to this land. And those soldiers have a reputation to uphold. Yeah, but doesn't it get you riled up when people are so rude? I laughed. <laughs> if rudeness were the worst foe we ever faced, we'd be lucky warriors indeed. In truth, I empathize with them. It is the duty of a soldier to fight. Incompetence on the battlefield is a matter of great shame. My unwanted assistance was salt in the wound. I guess I could see that, but still... Listen, no one was badly hurt. That is all that matters. I had trained many knights in my day. They had gone through their growing pains and tasting defeat humiliation yes failure is bitter but it is nourishment and thus the knights learned and grew each and every one of them into powerful warriors when it came to the finer points of warfare the forces of seed hollow were clumsy at best but their sense of duty was unparalleled upon hearing rumors of danger they had acted swiftly marching without fear to the monster's den. 
Though they had been forced to the very cusp of annihilation, not a soldier had wavered or fled. Now, they too had drunk deeply of the medicine of defeat. I believe it would course through them like fire and bring them newfound strength. The forces of Seed Hollow were capable of much, much more. I entered the warm wooden interior of my cabin on the Grand Cipher, carrying an armful of books. I lay them on the desk, drew out a chair, and took a short trip through Seed Hollow's history. Unbroken peace. For 500 years after the ending of the war, violence had not troubled the skies of Zeca Grande. There were your usual skirmishes, of course, power-hungry rebels, etc. But nothing so big it had not been quickly sorted out and buried in the sands of time. However, 15 years ago, tragedy on Dali Island acted as a catalyst to the rise of Avia. Hitherto, peaceful primals went on rampage and hordes of monsters were drawn to the carnage. So that's why... I thought back to the disordered ranks of the forces of Seed Hollow. Peace had dulled their senses. They had forgotten how to handle swords and spears, forgotten how to manage monsters, each one vastly different in shape and movement. They need guidance. The people of Seed Hollow seem to be gardeners, fond of orchards and good rich earth. They had no love of war, nor possessed the means for a great campaign. Unless a revolution were to completely reshape this country, I did not believe it would ever pose a threat to Fiendrock. Its forces existed not to invade, but solely to defend. But now, they had not even the power to do that. Seed Hollow's soldiers were steadfast and honorable, I had seen that, but they no longer knew how to protect their land. I had come to admire the delicate flowers and many bowed trees that flourished in this climb, and did not wish to see them trampled under a monster's claw or an invader's boot. I could offer Seed Hollow's forces counsel, but I would have to tread carefully. After all, I was a foreigner and a former captain of knights. One misstep, and I could forever sour the relations between Seed Hollow and Fiendrock. I will have to be discreet. I threw on my traveling cloak and arranged my pouch. Hearing no footfalls outside my room, I slipped through the door and padded softly down the corridor. Oh, hey, Siegfried. You heading out? Vern spotted me on the deck of the Grand Cipher, so much for stealing off unnoticed. I'm going for a walk. On your tiptoes? No way, man! I bet you're going on another one of your secret missions. Though small, Vern had inherited the legendary wisdom of the dragons. <sighs> Guilty as charged, but the fewer people who know about it, the better. Can you keep this from the others? Aw, uh, come on, Siegfried. We all know you won't yap for truth and honor and justice and all that. If you're gonna disappear, you should at least tell your captain. My butt'll understand. I could find no objection. It seemed that all the adventures Vern had been on, all the grand and wondrous things he'd seen, had sharpened his insight. Yes, of course. You're right. I followed Vern to the captain's cabin. I have come to ask for permission to leave on a private mission. But I must warn you, if things go wrong, it could spell trouble for the crew. My throat was tight, light nerves, I supposed, and a touch of guilt. But the captain did no more than smile 
and wish me a safe journey. What'd you expect? We trust you. Fortune truly had graced me with the best of companions. I strode through the gates of Seed Hollow. So, what you gonna do here? With a dragon on my tail? I would like to ask you the same question. Why did you follow me? Curiosity. What's a cool knight like you always doing when he leaves the Grand Cipher? Huh. Curiosity killed the lizard. But no matter. Vern and the captain had offered me their complete trust, so I could do the same in return. Besides, if anything were to happen, I'd be there to protect him. You're welcome to stay, but I am only visiting Seed Hollow's forces again to offer help if I may. Nothing of interest. Sounds like something my bud would do, but I thought you were going to leave them alone to help them save face or whatever. I was, but I realized that, in the end, the safety of the people is too heavy a price to pay for pride. That's fair. No offense, though, Siegfried. Your way with words is a little, um, special. So I'll just come along and do the talking. Twenty minutes later, Vern and I were in the heart of Seed Hollow, watching its soldiers scurry about like mice. Five hundred years of peace has truly taken its toll. Seed Hollow's forces had become only an army in name. In truth, the military affairs of the country were run by Zothma, a civilian and information broker. Everyone took orders from him. Dispatch from Zothma. We got a lost child on our hands. Everyone, split up and search for the mother. Yes, sir! Man. You ever just get lost and have a whole army look for your mom? Vern hovered by the branches of a tall oak, surveying the commotion with shining eyes. It is important to serve your people in times of concord as in times of strife, but I fear they have lost sight of their true duty. There is a saying, it is better to be a warrior in a garden than a gardener in a war. Peace should never so lull a nation that its defenses are abandoned and its soldiers turned into clerks and errand boys. Captain, new orders just came in. We're being sent to clear a horde of goblins camped right outside the city. Now these errand boys faced hordes of monsters who had been roused by Avia's machinations. Five hundred years of stillness, nature, and peace. Gone. All at the whim of a madwoman. You hear that, troops? Prepare for battle! Drive those goblins away from our homes! Yes, sir! They sure got bark. Problem is, they ain't got bite. Are you worried about them? Aren't you? You saw them get their butts kicked into the next skydom just a few days ago. I did. But failure is the mother of success. I readjusted my gauntlet and shifted my sword on my back. This is a chance for them to grow. I'll make sure of it. Vern and I left Seed Hollow and turned off the road, beating a straight path to the goblins' encampment through trees and underbrush. We arrived before the soldiers. In front of us, half hidden in the darkness of a cave, slinked the forms of dozens of goblins. 
Alone, goblins are not much of a threat. When they're allowed to form hordes, I... Oh, I know all about those smart little suckers. They can plot stuff and coordinate and everything. I smiled. Vern was as much of a veteran as I was. So earlier, you sounded like you were gonna help these soldiers out. What exactly have you got planned? As you know, all monsters are different and must be dealt with in different ways. We shall teach these tactics to the soldiers, but from the shadows. Plan rehearsed, Vern and I crept from the shade of the trees and into the mouth of the cave. Ready? Our mission awaits. We've got to break their formations. First, let's go for a frontal assault on the sentries. The army from Seed Hollow will be here any minute now! Hurry! <laughs> Don't worry. We won't even need a minute. Your edge is numb! Made it. Looks like the soldiers are still prepping for the fight. Perfect. That gives us just enough time to thin down their main ranks. A more gobble! Fear, the there's course. a lot of Stand them! Strong. Well, let's fix that, shall we? Be gone! This is power! Go no further! I can't believe they had so large a force. It's a good thing we came. Bear with I think there are a few more goblins hidden, but likely not enough to reverse the tide. We had still better conduct a search, just to be safe. Let's go in deeper. Look! It's a goblin soldier! And what are those? It's little sidekicks? I don't think Seed Hollow's forces will be able to handle this. We should at least bring down the goblin soldier. So leave all the small fry alone? Got it. Don't want to rob Seed Hollow's finest of a job. Watch out for the shooter! I'm ready! You're finished! Enough! Stop, stop roll. Stay the course! Stand strong! I'm not out yet! Great! Good hit. Just getting started. Push through. You're finished. Well, I think we're done here. The army from Seed Hollow should be capable of handling the rest. All right, let's head deeper in. Stay together and stay focused. Oh snap! Seems like they caught up. Let's hide. Holy Bahamut! We did it! The day is ours! Good work, troops! Vern and I crouched behind a craggy boulder and watched as the soldiers strode about the battlefield. Not a goblin was left. The voices of the triumphant rose up and resonated about the high, cool walls of the cavern. All went well. I guess, but those soldiers took a heck of a beating. Vern perched himself on top of the boulder 
head cocked to one side. They will continue to grow. They have experience now, and what's more, confidence. They will learn to keep their wits about them in battle, to observe the enemy, and strategize. If you're sure, there's uh, something I've been wondering about, though, Siegfried. You didn't have to help these people. You're not even getting paid for this. So why go through the trouble? I laughed softly. I think you already know the answer to that riddle. Because everything good in this world is worth protecting. We've received a special request. Three days after the victory in the caves, Vern rushed into my cabin. Dude, he's here! The captain of Seed Hollow's army is here! Here? On the Grand Cipher? My eyebrows drew themselves together. I was quite certain we hadn't been seen. Do you think he figured us out? No, no, that shouldn't be possible. I had lived and worked in the shadows for many years. I knew how to remain invisible. Let us meet him in any case. It would be discourteous to turn him away. Agreed. We're lots of things, but Rude ain't one of them. Vern led me to a spacious room on the Grand Cipher, where our guest sat perched on the edge of a comfortable chair, his hands upon his knees. He stood up quickly when we entered. It's, uh, been a while. He wouldn't quite meet my eyes. As the young man swallowed rather loudly, I recalled his last words to me. We can handle monsters without you swinging in to save the day. It has. I still regret my actions in the forest. Is that what you've come to talk about? No. He shook his head vigorously. I'm here to... Thank you. You saved my life, and the lives of my comrades. So, our presence had been noticed. I swept my cloak back in a deep bow. I apologize for interfering yet again. Oh, oh, no, please, stop with the apologies. You're just making me feel worse. Listen. He explained. Three days ago, Seed Hollow's army had been called upon to drive back a horde of goblins. He had marched his company there with a heavy heart, expecting great losses. But to his surprise, when they emerged from the goblin den, they were not missing even a single soldier. Goblins are intelligent. They post sentinels and form ranks, just like we do. Sword fighters and shield bearers in front, mages in back. Any battle with them should have been tough and bloody. Yet these goblins had no set sentries, and their forces were meager and scattered. Even the large beasts the goblins kept in reserve had been terribly weakened by the time Seed Hollow's forces reached it. But what could have worn it out like that? A night of partying too hard? No. Someone had to have helped us, and luckily, I had an inkling who. Now he raised his round, earnest face and looked straight at me. There was this knight who'd saved my troops before. He wore jet black armor and carried a crimson sword. Yeah, no way you'd forget that get up after seeing it once. Vern peered down at my armor. It was matte black, so I could slip by in the night unseen. But I suppose outlined against the light of the sun, it cut quite a distinctive figure. The rest really wasn't that difficult. Went with that description to a merchant who deals with a lot of foreign traffic, and learned about a former night captain. I see. Years away from the battlefield had dulled the army's swords. This I already knew. But now I realize it had allowed them to build rapport with their people, winning them trusted eyes and ears throughout their country. If anyone should be apologizing, 
It's me. Before I could stop him, he went down on one knee. That day in the forest, I was frustrated and ashamed by the weakness of my troops. So I took it out on you. I'm sorry. You saved my soldiers not only once, but twice. And the second time around, you even made sure we learned from the experience. I really don't know how to make it up to you. Vern and I looked at each other, surprised by the sincerity in his voice. Your kind words are more than enough, and your forgiveness. The young man opened his mouth, but I shook my head. Whatever the circumstances, I still trampled your pride underfoot. <laughs> What's pride when compared to life? To speak the truth, I thought Seed Hollow's forces poorly trained and disorganized. From an outsider's perspective, at least. By placing a hand beneath the man's elbow, I silently bid him rise. But I see now that you have strength and wisdom that was hidden to me. With you in command, I have no doubt your company will go on to accomplish great things. That means a lot, coming from you. He smiled, the tension melting from his frame. But the fact remains that I let my soldiers get out of practice. You've helped me realize a lot these past few days. And I promise, we'll train harder than ever, make up for lost time, and become the defenders this country deserves. Good. Never stop believing in yourselves. Seed Hollow. A land of gardeners who derive joy from the bounty of flora and the simplicity of peace. Though they were no longer the mightiest of warriors, they were by no means weak. No more than the wildflower, who holds aloft its petals in dry soil and through battering storms. And like wildflowers, they would continue to grow and flourish. Though Seed Hollow is a small country now, perhaps in time, it will rise to become a mighty nation. When that day comes, it surely will make a valuable ally for Fiendrock. Hey, is it just me, or have we been getting less monster hunting missions recently? We, as all Skyfarers, were used to shouldering the quests of greatest peril, as we've seen more combat than most standing armies. However, though Zega Grande was as plagued by monsters as ever, we'd had a quiet few days. I think I can explain. Lyria raised her hand, eager to impart valuable intelligence. Apparently, Seed Hollow's soldiers have been super on top of things lately. A monster appears, and before the Crew Alliance can even draft up a mission, they get in there and solve the problem. Good for them, but less work for us means less jingle in our pockets. Vern drifted to me from across the room, and positioning his snout by my ear, spoke in a whisper. Yes, they really got their act together, huh? It would certainly seem so. I looked up at my small comrade in training. We exchanged a secret smile. Well done, troops. Well done.
We've received a special request. When people ask me why I joined the society, I always give them the same answers. To get my hands on sick weapons, because the work was fun, and because I like busting my butt and actually getting rewarded for it. Sure, the society talked a good game about spreading freedom and protecting the Sky Realm's peace, but it wasn't like I ever set out to be a hero. But hunting primal beasts with badass seal weapons? <laughs> Sign me the hell up. Too bad there weren't enough weapons to go around. Only the best of the best become weapon contractors. Of course, I knew from the start I was contractor material. It wasn't long before I was making a pact with the Spear of Arvest. What a hot little number. Now, did I feel bad for those who didn't make the cut? Yeah, a little. But I earned my position. And no one was going to take that away from me. It wasn't about becoming rich or famous. It was about proving my worth. I don't like being undersold or underrated, you know? Best part was, as a weapon contractor, I had dibs on the deadliest missions. And those were perfect for showing everyone what I was made of. And damn, did the society have its fair share of enemies. The worst of which was an evil coalition we simply called the Foe, who only seemed to care about sowing chaos. As soon as I became a contractor, I was thrown into battle with the Foe. Talk about out of the frying pan and into the fire. My orders were explicit. Eliminate on sight. There were some days when the bloodshed took its toll on me. But then I'd remind myself that these villains were out to wreck the skies. When I wasn't putting bad guys into the ground, I hunted primal beasts to gather their battle data. See, seal weapons aren't just good at taking down primals. They absorb their powers, too. That's what makes our vest so special. The more primals it crushes, the stronger it gets. Imagine how unstoppable I'll be once I supercharge this bad boy. So, to recap, my average work week looks like this. Slave foes and primals, get paid. Then splurge all that cash on my days off. Look, if you're gonna work hard, you might as well play hard, right? Before I joined the society, I used to lead a group of knights. It was all fun and games, until the local lord tried to adopt me as his daughter. I never cared for social status, and I sure as hell didn't want to be tied down by expectations. My life, my reigns. So I said so long to my compatriots. It was nice knowing ya. But if playing by my own rules was so important to me, then why'd I throw in with the captain's crew? Well, I didn't do it just for funsies. My master plan was to have the crew members join the society too, which would have bought me a ton of brownie points with the higher ups. But journeying with the crew changed me. I met people from all walks of life, and I grew as a person. I started thinking I'd be better off following the crew instead of the society. I'm a natural-born fighter. Maybe I could put myself to better use elsewhere. Because honestly, becoming a contractor wasn't my main reason for seeking out the society. In the end, I just figured they were the organization that offered me the most freedom. So if it wasn't clear by now, I like doing things my way. Which brings me to a constant thorn in my side. Vasaraga, the annoying half of my two-man cell. Considering it was Drill Sergeant Ilsa who assigned us together, I figured she knew what she was doing. Yeah, no. Vasaraga and I gelled like oil and water. Did Ilsa really expect us to have good team chemistry? I think sticking him with me was an attempt to keep him from going off the deep end. 
Only later did I find out he'd been through some pretty traumatic events in his life. It scarred him, both physically and emotionally. Maybe that's why he can be borderline suicidal whenever someone else's life is at stake. Don't get me wrong, I'm all for helping people. I'm just saying it's 100% possible to play hero without throwing your life away. I remember this one time when we got trapped in a life or death situation because of his screw up. You should have heard the rage I was spewing. You know what he did next? He apologized, which just felt out of character coming from him. Like, even though it was your fault we're in this mess, don't just throw in the towel, man. Ugh, it was so frustrating. Who knew that big lug could be so sensitive? On the flip side, I can't help but be honest. I like what I like, and I hate what I hate. I don't want anyone getting the wrong impressions about me. I might say things that ruffle a few feathers, but I stand by my words. I can't take back what I've already said. Anyway, I'd rather be true to myself than be something I'm not. That's just the kind of gal I am. It was good to be back in Seed Hollow, after wrapping up another easy-peasy mission. Since my schedule was empty, I decided to hit up a cute little cafe for some much-deserved cake. Um, hello there! Some little kid I've never seen before walked right up to me, his eyes twinkling with starstruck awe. He got down on one knee and said, Will you marry me? Was this kid for real? Did he even know what he was asking? <laughs> You've got guts, little man. Tell you what, come find me in a decade or so, and then maybe we'll talk. I thought a gentle rejection would get him off my back, but I was wrong. If you walk away now, you'll be making the biggest mistake of your life. I knew better than to take the bait, but I had to admit, I was sort of curious. Okay, Hotshot, I'll bite. Why are you asking a total stranger like me to marry you? At least he had a good eye. Credit where credit's due. Because I know you're strong. You make stomping monsters look so easy. Oh, and you're really pretty, too. Wow, what do you know? A sweet talker. And your spear is wicked cool. How many monsters can you shish kebab with that thing? <laughs> I should have known. Boys love the heroic stuff. Ten? Twenty? It doesn't matter. The real prize is in hunting primal beasts. Oh, wait, you guys don't call them that. I meant primeval gods. I've got a soft spot for children, especially the ones who hang on my every word. You try ignoring the adorable little scamps. In any case, it seemed clear that this boy was genuinely head over heels for me. So, how about it? Will you marry me? Nope. Aw, oh, on. Word of advice, don't spring a marriage proposal on an unsuspecting woman. Catch you later, little man. Maybe we'll chat some other time. I ruffled his hair and started walking off. I'm not giving off. <laughs> the tyke knew how to dream big. If only a certain grumpy lug I knew had the same level of optimism. Hi, Azeda. Fancy running into you here. You're just as pretty as the first time we met. I had started to wonder if I'd ever see the little heartbreaker again. Guess I got my answer. We talked for a bit, and I learned his name was Vaughn. I knew which question he wanted to pop, 
but I didn't have time to humor him today. A hospital in Seed Hollow is in dire need of medicinal ingredients, so it was off to Fondom for me and the crew. Okay, gotcha. I understand. Well, that was easy, considering how he kept pestering me. I didn't expect him to be so reasonable. I know better than to get in the way of your job. I am a little worried, but I'm sure the monsters won't give you any trouble. You got that right. I eat monsters for breakfast. Aw, how sweet. The little doodlebug had total faith in me. Stay safe out there. Come back in one piece. I will, I will. As I left to meet up with the crew, I made a mental note to pick up a souvenir for my biggest little fan. Sweet! I think that's everything on the list. Good, cause this heat's killing me. Let's get back to the ship. Sign this place is ready to blow sky high. Well, I'm not sticking around to find out. Let's keep moving. Being boiled alive is bad enough. Now I gotta deal with wyverns? Uh, I think the ground's moving into the lava. No, screw these flying lizards. Where's the exit? I see it too. Oh, great. Now, fuck. Can't go that way. It'll be easy, they said. This fight. Ah, fire spirit. Oh, I'm sorry I ever set foot in this oven. Come on, our best. We are through. Excellent execution. <laughs> We're safe here. Maybe. Man, I really worked up a sweat. At least we didn't lose anyone. Grand Cypher's just up ahead. Come on! What are 
with the odds of bumping into a golem in here. We knew I had so many fervent fans. Thanks for making a gal feel loved. And show my appreciation. I'm gonna turn you to scrap. Infinite wonder! Show them who's boss! Who's right? You know! Over here! Stay vigilant! Fair enough! I was just getting bored! Qualifies for hazard pay. Oh, who am I kidding? Say your prayers! Hey, what's this? A piece of rock from the golem? I like the way it glitters. Might make a neat souvenir for a certain someone I know. Well, not bad for a day's work. Vaughn was the first person to greet me when I returned to Seed Hollow. He ran over to me like an overexcited puppy. Here, I got you a little something for being good. Whoa, this rock is crazy! It's all shiny and stuff! I'm a pro at picking out gifts, if I do say so myself. After all, what kid isn't mesmerized by shiny objects? Vaughn wouldn't stop thanking me. I honestly didn't think he'd like it that much. But in this case, I was happy to be wrong. It's amazing how you made it out of fondom without a scratch. You're a one-woman wrecking crew. Hmm. <laughs> Can't argue with the truth. Anyway, it's cool that you're being nice to me. But I don't mind when you play hard to get either. Huh? <laughs> the nerve of this kid. Are you blushing? <laughs> what? His confidence was respectable. Admirable, even. But seriously, get real, little man. Ugh, talking to you makes my head spin. Does that mean you're falling for me? No, it means I'm worried about your future. Years from now, Vaughn's gonna be breaking hearts left and right. Mark my words. We've received a special request. Hey there, Zeta! So glad I caught you again. How did he always know when I was in Seed Hollow? He was clueless to his clinginess. And it was testing my patience. Are you free today? I was thinking we could go on a picnic. I mulled it over for a bit. A picnic didn't sound half bad. It was a nice day after all. Oh no. Is this a bad time? His puppy dog eyes bore into my soul. How could I say no to that? Kids just have this way of triggering your protective instincts. Not to mention they can be terrifyingly perceptive. You know what? The weather's great today, so count me in. His face lit up with joy, and I turned to my next important decision. What to have for lunch? I didn't have to think too hard about that. When it came to picnics, sandwiches were the only way to go. This must be the lad I've heard so much about. A few days earlier, I was in the ship's lounge telling the captain about Vaughn when Vasaraga happened to walk in. So he ended up learning about the kid, too. He listened without saying much. Never was the talkative type, anyway. Hi, mister. I'm Vaughn. 
I half expected Vaughn to cower from Vasaraga, but instead the boy dropped a friendly hello. Maybe he had a strict upbringing. Call me Vasaraga. Vasaraga looked at me, then at Vaughn, then back at me again. What did he want? So that's how it is. Here, Zeta. Take these. I peeked into the bag he gave me and did a double take. It was stuffed with fruit sandwiches. These come highly recommended by Vern, Lyria, and the Captain. You should split them with Vaughn. For the both of us? Huh. Call me crazy. But it almost sounded like he went out of his way to buy these for us. I rummaged through the goods and caught sight of one sandwich stuffed with melon slices and another with peaches. Nice. Those are my favorites. Hey, great pickups, Vasaraga. Can't wait to scarf these down. Go for it. Cha-ching! Jackpot! Vaughn and I said our goodbyes to Vasaraga. And we found an open bench in a park just outside the city. You look really happy. Are you a big fruit fan? I was jamming an ungodly amalgamation of fruit, bread, and whipped cream into my face. I think that counts as a yes. Yeah, more or less. I like anything as long as it's tasty. Ah, that's good to know. There was no chance in hell Vasaraga picked out these cute sandwiches all by himself. Absolutely none. Someone in the crew must have tagged along. The thought of him stomping through the aisles of a shop filled with cupcakes and cookies drew a chuckle out of me. So, um, are you and Vasaraga an item? <coughs> are we an item? Gross! Is that what it looks like to you? Look, he's just my co-worker. I'm kind of stuck with him. Uh-huh. He opened his mouth as if he had more to say. But I guess he changed his mind. We ended up having a fascinating chat about bugs instead. Good afternoon, Zeta! It's always nice to see you. It was another gorgeous day. Vaughn came bounding over to see me for like... What, the hundredth time? Or maybe even millionth? I wanted to give you something to say thanks for the souvenir you got me. I hope you like it. He held out a beautifully wrapped box, its sides emblazoned with the logo of a world-class bakery. <sighs> I didn't know what to say. Kids ought to be spending their lunch money on cheap snacks, not fancy pants pastries. Are you sure you want me to have this? How could you even afford this with pocket change? Don't you know it's discourteous to appraise the worth of one's gift? Uh, how do you know big words like that? Papa told me. Oh, great. Don't tell me he got his family involved. I wanted to show you how much I care, so I saved up my allowance. Sierra Carte helped me pick a shop that's popular with girls. Vaughn stared at the ground as he spoke, stealing an occasional glance at me to gauge my reaction. He had put his feelings out there in the only way he knew how, and it was all coming to a head. In a situation like this, I had to be firm yet considerate. I could never live with myself if I trampled over his heart, even if I didn't mean to. I thought for sure you'd like it. I guess I was wrong. He kicked at the dirt, still unwilling to meet my gaze. Wow. As if I didn't feel guilty enough already. What are you talking about? This is an awesome gift. Thank you. As soon as I said that, his toothy smile came roaring back with a vengeance. But from now on, you can't give me any more presents. Why not? In one fell swoop, he turned my words against me. Poor boy was on the verge of tears. His voice quivered as he explained his intent. 
He had seen how delighted I was with Vasaraga's gift of sandwiches. And all he wanted was to deliver that same joy. Oh, you sweet darling boy. You've got a lot to learn. But your heart's in the right place. I'd hate to leave you jaded. I decided that honesty was the best course of action. No more tiptoeing around the issue. It's a lovely gift. But I'm worried you're not eating enough to grow big and strong. That's why I want you to spend your money on snacks for yourself, okay? Okay, got it. Way to go, Zeta. So much for being up front with him. I'm glad you understand. Now why don't we dig into this yummy treat together? Sure. I'd be happy to feed you. Gah. Why, you conniving little... My hands work just fine, thank you very much. Oh, From now on, I'm gonna prove that we're meant for each other. The talk I had with Vaughn yesterday only intensified his resolve. I asked him what he had in mind. First, I'll get to know you better, Zeta. A little late for that, but at least he was thinking in the right direction. Well, let me see. Okay, first question. What's your type of guy? Subtlety wasn't Vaughn's strongest point. How to be compatible with your partner is something you should figure out for yourself. Huh? But I don't know how to do that. It's faster just to ask. Hmm. <laughs> this kid. Hmm. <clears throat> do you like strong guys? You could say that. I prefer someone who knows how to fend for themselves. It means I don't have to worry about them as much. Well, that's perfect then. Vaughn stood up straight and tall and proudly puffed out his chest. I'm still in the middle of sword training, but I'm the best out of all the kids in the class. Even the bigger ones. Already outclassing the older kids, huh? Not bad, not bad. I wonder how I stacked up when I was his age. Now do you love me? Not even close. Pooey. <laughs> His reactions cracked me up. There was never a dull moment with this kid. Uh, there has to be a way for me to win your heart. <laughs> I'm sorry, but that was just too precious. I didn't mean to laugh, but his frustration caught me off guard. He was trying so hard against the odds to win me over. If we were around the same age, things might have been different. I don't care about being precious. I care about you. The more he sulked, the harder it became to hold in my giggles. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. I patted his head in an attempt to lighten the mood, but he wasn't having it. <laughs> Bahamut saved me. This kid was so sweet he was gonna give me cavities. The air in Seed Hollow that morning was electric. I hadn't felt that amped up in a good while. Time to get this show on the road. Roger that. Vasaraga had met up with me right on schedule. I sucked in a lungful of the morning chill to calm my nerves. Good morning, Zeta. Good morning, Vasaraga. Morning. You're up awfully early today. Where are you guys going? He must have sensed something big was in the works. The concern in his voice was clear as day. A couple of rough customers challenged us to a serious fight. I want to come too. Can I please? 
It wasn't like him to try to tag along. He knew better than that. No can do, little man. This isn't a game. But... but I've been practicing my sword swings every day! I can help you beat them! Of all the days he could have picked to be fussy, why did it have to be today? Sparring and actual combat are worlds apart. Pride goeth before destruction. It was obvious from the frown on Vaughn's face that he wasn't going to take no for an answer. I need you to be good and listen to us, all right? We left Vaughn behind and made a beeline for Seed Hollow Castle. We stepped into its great hall, where Magliel and her sword veil were already waiting. Allow me to extend my utmost gratitude for taking the time to indulge my invitation. Ugh, can the formalities. I came here to throw down, not listen to boring speeches. I didn't think the castle would be okay with us doing battle within its walls. Well, no one else was using the hall. Let's just say those who help with the castle's restoration are afforded special privileges. This woman, for all her pomp and circumstance, was no joke of a warrior. I was curious as to whether your weapons are deserving of their legend. My fellowship prides itself with collecting only the most prized armaments. Ha! I knew there had to be more to this call-out. I'll get straight to the point. We are interested in purchasing your seal weapons. Allow me to appraise their performance during our little skirmish. In other words, she was making us an offer we couldn't refuse. Even though this isn't a fight to the death, don't come crying to me when you get your asses handed to you. Magliel didn't respond. She simply smirked and an arsenal of magic swords materialized around her. I tightened my grip on our vest and took a deep breath. I thought back to all the times Vasaraga and I had cheated death. It made me feel invincible. This victory belonged to us. Let's do this, Seda. Hell yeah! The words were barely out of my mouth before I was leaping into the fray. <laughs> Is this a waltz of warriors? On guard! Now then, may I have the first dance? See what you will about her, but she's got plenty of style. Don't get distracted. She's no ordinary foe. Now it's on. No! 
Longer. Yeah. What a shame. Nah, you put up a good fight. I'm down to spar again anytime. Oh, yeah. This you cannot fight with me. Cannot ah. be. <laughs> Infinite Wonder. Oh, no. <laughs> How about you? Good. Hold it. <laughs> Just a flesh wound. Over here! 
for exhibiting the beauty of Arves and Grinna. You're not so bad yourself. Most people would have lost to us by now. Hell yeah! Score one for us! You better have a good reason for sneaking in here, little man. I didn't want you getting hurt. That's all. Oh, why didn't you stay put like I told you to? I said this wasn't a game. There's no excuse for being a distraction on the battlefield. Every swordsman knows that, even rookies. Vaughn fell silent, realizing he couldn't argue back. He just stood there with his head hanging down. Crap. Was I too hard on him? But here's the thing about warfare. If you're all valor and no discretion, you're gonna end up in a coffin real fast. I messed up. I'm sorry. Vaughn looked so miserable. It was like watching a kid choke down bitter medicine. <sighs> what could I say to soften the blow? You made a mistake, but your intentions were true. It takes courage to own up to one's error and apologize. Vasaraga gently clapped the boy on the shoulder with his rugged mitt. Vaughn quickly perked up after that. Vasaraga's like a giant teddy bear when it comes to kids. I can count on him to smooth things over when I get too preachy. No arguments there. Oh well. What's done is done. Me chewing you out isn't gonna change the past. Thanks, Vasaraga. I needed that save. Hold on, Zeta. Don't move. He reached up and applied a cool, damp salve onto my right cheek. I wasn't lying when I said I was worried about you. See? You did get injured. Hey, even the pros get banged up every now and then. It's not really an injury, per se. More like a scratch. I'm amazed you even spotted it. Just so you know, this medicine was made from the ingredients you collected. The hospital director was really happy for your help. Sheesh. When was the last time someone coddled me this much over a tiny cut? I had to admit it felt nice. Thank you, Vaughn. I think we're about done here. Come on, Vaughn. I'll take you home. If I didn't know any better, I'd say Vaughn had taken a shine to the big guy. It wasn't hard to see why. 
given the way Vasaraga treated him with kid gloves and all. You have my thanks for giving me a taste of Arves and Grinoth. You both handled those weapons with skill and finesse. Damn right we did. You didn't even make us break a sweat. <laughs> Is that so? I got the sense that this weapons nut wasn't actually invested in the fight itself. She just wanted an excuse to research our vest. And maybe to brag about her own collection. Kind of funny how just talking about tools of destruction sends her into a frenzy. Then again, I get hyped about testing my combat skills, so who am I to judge? By the way, I think we deserve a bit of compensation for our troubles. Oh dear, how silly of me. You're right. I must pay the price for losing the challenge. I suppose I could bid farewell to my precious, beloved Gaiborg. <laughs> oh, come on. Don't make me out to be the bad guy. How about this? Why don't you treat me to the tastiest dessert this Skydom has to offer? Magliel's frown vanished in the blink of an eye, and her tears dried up like magic. Though I'm not even sure she was crying in the first place. Why, it would be my pleasure. Did you know there is a hidden gem of a bistro that serves pancakes topped with rare fruits right here in Seed Hollow? Shut up! What kind of rare fruits are we talking about? She was literally bouncing with excitement. Cultivated by only the greenest of green thumbs, each luxurious piece of nature's candy is a crowning achievement of sweetness. The cream of the crop. You simply must taste it to believe the capital's best kept secret. Huh. So you do have other hobbies outside of weapon collecting. Alrighty, you're on. I'll be in touch about dates and stuff. As I left the castle hall behind, I saw that Vasaraga and Vaughn hadn't got much of a head start on me. I ran to catch up to them, all the while wondering, does Vasaraga like pancakes? And as strange as it sounds, out of all the missions I'd wrapped up lately, I hadn't felt a greater sense of accomplishment than in that moment. We've received a special request. After the showdown with Magliel, it was a while before I saw Vaughn again. Hey, little man. I was wondering when you were gonna pop in. How you holding up these days? His hair had grown out a bit since we last talked. I had no idea that much time had already passed. He seemed downcast, as if he had something heavy on his mind. Maybe I could get him to open up about it. Is there something you want to get off your chest? Yeah, how should I put this? I, uh, I like you, Zeta. He was trying to keep his embarrassment at bay, but the way he fumbled his words betrayed his emotions. Thanks. Is that all you wanted to tell me? No, there's more. I'm gonna get stronger. As strong as you and Vasaraga. He had a deadly serious look in his eye. Kid must have thought long and hard about this. Is that so? Here was a side of Vaughn I had never seen before. More earnest. More mature. I felt a swell of pride as a smile crossed my face. Yup. That's why I'm calling off all marriage proposals for now. Oh? Why the sudden 180? <sighs> I just think it'd be better for us to stop seeing each other for a while. Huh. It's going to be tough on me, too. But I think we both need time apart. I did not see this coming. No, uh-uh. Don't talk like that. I refuse to let anyone get the wrong idea about us. But I can't marry you yet. 
There wasn't gonna be a wedding anyway. My point is you and I were never. I'm sorry, Zeta. It's not you. It's me. Ugh, stop! Don't even think about saying another word. <laughs> Ugh. He wasn't listening to me anymore. He'd already written his own head cannon. But you know what? It was sort of nice to be doted on. For what it's worth, I'd like to think I taught him a few life lessons, too. I'd forgotten what it was like to view the world through the innocent eyes of a child. Hanging out with Vaughn took me back to a simpler time. <laughs> Thanks for jogging my memory, little man. Funny thing is, dwelling on the past isn't my style. Not at all. Living in the now is my ammo. But one thing's for sure. I'll never forget the time I spent with Vaughn. Dear Zeta, I'm doing well. How about you? Thanks to all the hours I put into sword practice, the dojo accepted me as a disciple. I'm on my way to becoming a man worthy of your hand. I'm sorry you have to wait, but someday I'll take this stone you gave me to Fulka and have it made into a ring. Take care of yourself. Sincerely, Vaughn. P.S. I don't mind if you see other people if it's just a fling. <laughs> You cheeky little brat. You just keep doing your thing, Vaughn. It's funny how you don't miss someone until they're gone. Regardless, I was happy to hear that Vaughn was doing well for himself. It's okay to see other people, huh? <laughs> That's a good one. Ah, oh, it's such a nice day today. The breeze was subtle, and there wasn't a cloud in the sky. Just as I was beginning to take in the morning calm, a lone figure appeared on the deck of the Grand Cipher. Greetings, Zeta. Are you ready for the best pancakes of your life? You better believe I was ready. Nothing gets between me and my dessert. Now let's just say when I arrive in Seed Hollow, and a certain lovelorn puppy dog comes sprinting over to propose to me, my answer to him would be... In your dreams, little man. Today is my first day off in forever, and I'm gonna party it up! Come again! We've received a special request. Mother said she would bring us salvation. It was a glorious message. And for that, she gained a devoted following. As for me, how could I doubt the woman who pulled me from the fiery wreck, who raised me as her own? I thought that together, we would save the Sky Realm, even if it meant cutting down any who opposed us. But over time, the sacrifices began to mount. I... I struggled. My reason battled with my heart, which battled with my conscience. Mother was pure and righteous, but to sacrifice the entire Sky Realm... No. She just lost her way for a bit. She'd wake up one day and see she had strayed. As her child, as her defender, I wanted to believe that she'd change for me. Even at the very end, when I was forced to turn my sword on her, I was praying for an alternative. Any alternative. But she would not repent. 
and I was confronted with the full force of the atrocities I'd committed in Avia's name. But there was one light left to guide me. Just follow your heart. It might lead you to scary places, but at least you'll know you're being true to yourself. Thank you, Lyria. If you hadn't reminded me of my own strength, I'd still be in the dark following Lilith. I swear to you that I will fix even more than I destroyed. And one day, perhaps I will be worthy of your forgiveness. Fifteen years ago, Dali fell prey to a violent catastrophe. One that still lives etched in my mind. There was an explosion. Immense and sudden. My home went up in flames, and with it the only life I had ever known. People were fleeing and dying in all directions. The air was filled with screams and the smell of burning. Then I heard it. The soul-piercing roar of a dragon. My short life should have come to an end that day. Except... Shh. It's okay. Let me be the one to save you. Salvation came in the form of a kind woman. Her name was Lilith, prophet of the pilgrims of Avia. From that day forth, she was both my mother and mentor. <sighs> I worshipped her, and the thing about devotion is, it makes you blind. Mother had followers in the hundreds, thousands, and my simple child's mind thought, well, if this many people have faith in her, she has to be good, right? I wanted desperately to be of use to her, so I trained to be the perfect guardian. Young E, one day you shall be as mighty as I. General Galanza taught me how to fight. You wouldn't want the other pilgrims saying you're riding your mother's coattails, would you? Then you must prove yourself. General Magliel taught me why we fight. Her training was harsh, but that's how I acquired the makings of a general. All effort... No nepotism. Finally, I had some value to Mother. Her sharpest sword. I never felt happier or more accomplished. I thought we were going to save the Sky Realm. The naivete of it all. After we captured the Shaman of Salvation for Lilith's cause, I was assigned to be the girl's keeper. That made me enemy number one to the Grand Cypher's crew. Every time I took Lyria to a Primal Beast altar, they'd be there, and we'd fight. I mean, there was a time or two we had to cooperate to prevent widespread calamity. But that's beside the point. They were standing in the way of Lilith's mission, opening a path to the Promised Land to Estelusia, and bringing salvation to all Sky Dwellers. Salvation. That's a powerful word in a messed up world like ours. No wonder everyone got roped in by her lies. Lilith was no more than an astral desperate to return to her home dimension, and she would have sacrificed the whole Sky Realm to do it. I tried to reason with her. Might as well have asked an avalanche to change course. So I turned to prayer. But what are hopes and belief without action? So left with no other choice, I joined the crew of the Grand Cipher to dispatch my own mother. But I never could have foreseen what would happen next. Lilith did something. 
and freed a monster from within me. The dragon I'd seen the day Dolly burned. With wings so vast, they overshadowed all of Sega Grande. Bahamut Versa. But then I learned, Bahamut didn't cause the Dolly calamity. It had come to stop it. It was Lilith who killed my family and raised my home. She'd only let me live for one reason. She needed a vessel to seal the dragon in. And I was conveniently nearby. She'd raised me to win my loyalty and protect herself from the god of destruction now living inside me. But when I stopped being of use to her, she abandoned me and let me turn in to Bahamut. I don't know how to describe the feeling of flesh melting into scales, a fire filling your stomach. All human warmth, human blood seemed to rush from my veins, and it was replaced by an overwhelming urge to destroy. It was like being swept away in a torrent. Any attempt to fight it only made the suffering worse. I was so tempted to give in, but the crew wouldn't let me. Apparently, the captain was sure I wouldn't lose my soul battle with Bahamut. So to help me along, they decided to beat on the dragon from the outside until he coughed me up. Yeah, not the most elaborate plan, but it worked. The whole time they were fighting, they called my name, and the sound of their voices brought me back. I split myself from Bahamut, then joined the crew to take it down. We had our losses, though. Bahamut hit me and the captain with a blow that sent us hurtling into another dimension. A man named Roland dove in to save us, sacrificing himself along the way. And that's how we came back to Folka without him. Roland used to be the local Mr. Fixit, by the way. And I took up that mantle. I owed him that much. And I figured it'd be a first step in making amends. And that's where this new chapter in my life begins. Me, as the new Mr. Fixit. After clearing up some requests, I thought I'd earn some, I don't know, respect, honor, from the crew alliance or folly. But it seems you can't buy forgiveness so easily. Ahem. <clears throat> so I believe we're all aware of Avia's assault on Seed Hollow? She looked straight at me as she spoke. The actions of the pilgrims, myself included, had left a number of locals without homes. There was a plan to resettle volunteers in Tempil. Give them a fresh start. They're going to be out in the open, moving, building. This includes children and the elderly. Your job would be to protect the settlers until their homes are up. Trustworthy Skyfarers only. Hey, don't push yourself. You can sit this one out, you know. Rackham lay a hand on my shoulder, but I shook my head at him. We take it. This is right. I couldn't stay stuck in the past forever. I needed to move on. I needed to help those I hurt move on. It wasn't an easy choice, though. Our patron... The family who was bankrolling this mission didn't know I'd worked for Avia. And I didn't know if I had the guts to tell them. Yeah, I know. How am I supposed to atone for crimes I'm too scared to admit? Still, one step at a time. Too much of a coward to take responsibility? Fine. I could at least start by repairing some of the damage I'd done. I'd make sure the settlers built in peace. And if one of them happened to find out about my past, then that would be that. 
I'd accept whatever punishment they saw fit to give me. It didn't matter where I hid, or how far I ran. Retribution would find me eventually. The ride to Tempeel was uneventful. The proposed relocation site was set near an old storehouse by the river. There was water here, and the building could be repurposed for homes. The migrants dragged their feet and often looked back towards Seed Hollow. Most had been born and raised there. We'd been hired as bodyguards, but for the time being at least, all was quiet. Just the sound of wind and running water. Patrols didn't take long, and only one or two people had to go at a time. The rest of us found other ways to keep busy. Carrying supplies, repairing the storehouse, prepping materials, cooking. Whatever needed doing, we did it. While the adults were building the new body of the village, the children, they were forming the new heart of it. It's amazing how kids can find happiness in just about anything. The world's fresh and new to them. Down by the river, they discovered unfamiliar plants and bugs with funny shapes. In the old storehouse, they looked for hidden treasure and lost stories. Sure, sometimes they got in the way of work and were scolded. But you could tell the adults appreciated having the kids around. It gave them hope. Eo and Lyria were their self-appointed babysitters. They called it serious work, but it looked like fun and games to me. Those kids didn't have a care in the world. Well, all except one of them. There was a girl who would always glance my way, pretty much from day one of this job. I say girl, but she was a Harvin, so her age was hard to pinpoint. But she played with the kids more than she worked, so I assumed. Anyways, turned out she was a teenager. That would explain the looks she gave me. I don't think any kid could have been filled with such fear, such anger, such hate. Didn't take much to guess why she had a grudge against me. But she made sure I knew. It happened one day when I was on my way to the storehouse to stack some freight. She was in my path, and since I had a load of boxes in my arms, I almost bowled her over. Ah, don't come closer! Her voice was loud and shrill. I won't hurt you. I promise. Yeah, right. Everyone else might have forgotten you, but I haven't. We're here because of you. Her name was Shiralu, 14 years old. Parents volunteered to come on this resettlement mission after they had lost their livelihoods back in Seed Hollow. She had reason to hate me. During this whole exchange, I felt strangely... relieved. No more waiting in the shadows, trying to work up the courage to atone. Atonement had come for me. Why are you here? To take our new homes? Never. I only wished I were better with words. To convey even a fraction of the guilt I felt. To give her even the slightest comfort. Not a day goes by where I don't regret what I've done. I wanted to tell her I was ready to repent. But my voice came out flat. Insincere. But she was cut off by warning bells. I raced back to the settlement center, where I found Rackham. Goblin sighting! Get everyone inside the gates, Prano! His voice rose up over the cacophony. An attack! But my father 
just left for the storehouse. Remain here. I'll find him. I left without waiting for a response. Come on! Just like we practiced! We'll handle the goblins. Everyone's safe. Should be. That's why we're here, isn't it? Now come on, we got goblin tail to kick. What are they made of? Never enough! It's over! The pawn struggles. Here. There's more here. They're trying the pincer maneuver. Burn, you watch over the settlers. Got it. Leave it to me. You're mine! They all come from. Heard this place used to be Monster Central. Guess these are the stragglers. Bad news, guys. Some girl named Shirelu has gone missing. No, what if she? Don't assume anything, Lulu. First, we secure the area, then we start a search. <laughs> Isn't that the hog? Hey, do you know something? Great. We'll get the search party started. Uh, right after these messages. Dad. Then what are we waiting for? Let's go! Heads up! There's another goblin band over here! What? Shirolu, where did you go? Focus on the fight at hand! Here they come! Here to help. Do you think you can stay hidden for a bit? Yeah, I can do that. Thank you. There's more. Out of my way. Wait, I recognize that voice. They're wide open. They're mine. I like what I see. Was my honor. Never enough. Play my blade. Looks like we're all clear. You can come out now, Shirolu. <laughs> it was a close call, but we managed to find Shirolu in time. Everything's going to be okay now. Thank you. Lyria ran over to the girl. 
I don't think Shirulu was injured, but her face was pale, and her lips were tight. It had to have been me. The reason she looked so pained. If I hadn't forced her from her home, she wouldn't have almost lost her life. I turned and walked a few steps. I'll secure the way back. Bring her when she feels better. Wait, Id? Shirulu needed good people around her. What did I ever bring but suffering? We've received a special request. The day after the goblin attack, I had an unlikely visitor. Shirulu. You didn't have to save me, but thank you. That took me completely off guard. I searched wildly in my mind for a response, but all that came out was... I was just trying to do the right thing. Look, Avia almost destroyed Seed Hollow, and I won't ever forgive you for that. Do you know how many people were hurt? I'm sorry. Like I said, words, not my strong point. Is there any way I can make amends? I will do anything. She looked at me for a moment. Her lips working, searching for an answer. Her eyes slowly welled up with tears. Can you bring back the dead? <laughs> I didn't think so. If I could trade my life for even one I'd taken, I'd have done it in a heartbeat. But she was right. Those people were gone, and never coming back. I can't talk about this now. Maybe I shouldn't have come. Have a good... goodbye. She turned and walked away. Her voice shook the entire time we were talking. With anger, I guessed. And grief. But she'd still forced herself to thank me. It hit me then how kind she was. If Avia had never existed, she might have never known the corrosive influence of hate. Our crimes went beyond the people we killed. Even those that survived, they now had to live with the trauma and sleepless nights. It was all so heavy. I was beginning to see that I'd never be able to atone. Not if I had 100,000 years and all the power in the skies. We now knew the settlement was a prime target for goblins. We'd cleared out a band of them, but there would always be more. We decided to tighten our defenses. More frequent patrols with bigger teams. I was quick to volunteer for the first shift. Uria, Vern, and the captain came along. Hey, we noticed things are kind of tense between you and Shirilu. Do you want to talk about it? Lyria kept pace beside me, peering up into my face. What's there to say? My past was for me to solve. I didn't need to make the crew part of my guilt. She knew, didn't she, that you were once part of Avia? All right, fine. Who was I kidding? No one kept secrets with these three around. Someone was going to find out eventually. Just don't worry about it. But Vern and Lyria pushed back buds now, right? Your problems are my problems. 
Exactly. We can talk to Shirilu together. This is your chance to make things right. You know, sometimes when you feel lost in a hostile world, that's all it takes to put things into perspective. A few kind words. Okay. But there's no half-assing it. Whatever Shirilu asks, we give it to her. Do you understand? I was offered no answer, but their eyes told me enough. Sins are only burned away through atonement. This was the way things had to be. We walked for a while in silence, until finally the captain nodded. And I was told the crew would do what was right. Days passed, and the demeanor of the settlers when they were around me began to change. Bright eyes turned into cold stares. Open hands clenched into fists, smiles morphed into sneers. They had begun avoiding me, too. It was easy enough to guess why. On an afternoon, buried under grey clouds, the rest of the crew gathered around me in a show of solidarity. I'd recommend keeping your distance. I'm a known criminal now. I stared ahead of me into empty space. Maybe Shiralu had told the others about me. Maybe she hadn't. What did it matter? The truth was bound to come out eventually. This was justice. But, Id, you didn't hurt anyone because you wanted to. You were being controlled. The captain knelt beside me and pointed out excuses I'd rehearsed in my mind a million times before. That as a child, I couldn't have known the difference between right and wrong. That as an adult, I was blinded by my love for Lilith. That in choosing to turn against my family for the sake of the skies, I had sacrificed the most. Yeah. I had misguided intentions, so what? If that were a real defense, we wouldn't have any villains, would we? I deserve to be judged for my actions, and my actions alone. They all fell silent after that. Shirilu found me during one of my patrols. She stood in front of me, fidgeting with the cloth of her skirt. I'm sorry. I only told one person and then... somehow everyone found out. With all due respect, save your apologies. Looking back, I realize I should have chosen my words more carefully. Something like, you don't have to apologize. All you told them was the truth. You know. Something a person with a heart would have said. No, you don't get it! Yeah, she had a right to be upset. Only I could have sounded so accusing when what I really meant to say was... It wasn't your fault. Just tell me one thing. Did the church really brainwash you? And... Did you really have to fight your own mother? What? Where do you hear about that? Your friend told me. The captain. Of course. The captain promised me the crew would do what was right. Guess that meant giving my whole backstory to Shiralu. Anyways, it doesn't matter where I heard it. What matters is whether it's true or not. So... Why did she need to know? Would my good intentions bring back the dead? Shiralu knew the answer to that as well as I did. My past is no excuse. So it is true. You're a victim. 
just like us. No. I was the perpetrator. I had to be the perpetrator. How else could I explain the guilt that sat on my chest and made it hard to breathe? But before I could say any of this, I was interrupted by the shrill ringing of warning bells. What's going on? Just as before, Rackham was making rounds to explain the situation. It looks bad. Our supply runners are under goblin attack. Supply routes were the lifeline of any settlement. They needed to be cleared immediately. I'll head out now. Shirulun, find your family and get to safety. <sighs> okay, I won't leave the village this time. Good. I met up with the others, and we left for battle. Well, thank goodness you're here! If we lose these supplies, we lose the village! You have to now! No problem, though. Goblin Hunter's my middle name. Less talking, more fighting! such a stratagem! Thank you! <laughs> Words in reserve. This looks bad! More goblins are headed for the village! What? Now? We can't abandon the supplies. I'll go back. Can you handle things here? Sure can. You just worry about getting to the village in time, hero boy. All right, Ed. Let's roll! Less than I thought. Perfect. Where are those skyfarers? I'm so scared. Someone's here. It's it's Id. Stay inside. Don't come out until I say so. You're planning to fight them alone? But you can't win. You've never you. seen no. Id when he's serious. He'll be fine. What's going to happen to us? <laughs> Back off! We know that Avio bought this of our old homes. But right now, it's fighting to protect our new ones. All I've wanted was to protect people. I know I've made mistakes in the past. But I have changed. And I'll prove it! He's facing all those monsters. But if it weren't for him, then we wouldn't be in this situation. Again. I'll stop them! Fall! But it's no longer one of them. He helped build this village, and now he's protecting it. That means he's become one of us. I believe in Ed. He's our last hope. Please, Ed. Hold 
Done. My sword cut clean through the last goblin. It's over. As I pulled my blade clear of its flesh, it trailed an arc of blood through the air. I felt the settlers behind me, watching, judging. You see, I thought, this is the kind of monster I am. I can't believe it! You did it, Ed! You really did it! Shirilo broke the silence with the cheer. For me, I had to say something. The goblins are gone. All at once, the migrants rushed me. Hands took hold of me and lifted me into the air. Those were fearsome odds, but you pulled through! You saved us! Thank you, Id. These people knew I had destroyed their homes. So why were they rallying to me? Sorry I'm late. What'd I miss? The crew was now filing back into the village. They gazed up at me, open-mouthed. I'm sure I looked back at them with pretty much the same expression. Nothing. Just it single-handedly annihilating a goblin army. The settlers finally put me down and began telling exaggerated accounts of the battle. I tried to take the opportunity to slink off and find conversation with something more my level. Maybe a tree or something. Hey, just where do you think you're sneaking? Is our resident bad boy feeling shy? I shot Rackham my nastiest look. 
but only because he had guessed the truth. You should be proud, Id. You saved everyone here. Come on, Lyria. It had to be obvious that I wanted to be left to myself. Truth was, I didn't think I deserved all this praise. So I saved a small settlement. Great. Guess we'd forgotten I've also raised entire cities. The captain strolled up to me and, after elbowing me in the ribs, asked, How was it to fight for the good guys? That, I had an easy answer to. Not bad, I said. Not bad at all. We've received a special request. The morning after the second goblin strike, the sun rose on a quiet scene. The river glinted gold, the grass stirred in the breeze. The migrants came with our breakfast and a peace offering. Avia attacked our homeland. We'll never forget that pain. But you proved yourself a true ally yesterday. Everyone saw you risk your life for us. You've earned our trust. They seem to be leading up to something, so I asked with my usual eloquence. And... Well, if it's all right with you, we'd like you to stay and protect our fledgling village. I could not believe my ears. No. I... I'm not the person for the job. I've committed atrocities. Ed... Lyria's voice sounded from behind me. I turned to see her smiling. You're right. She hadn't said anything, but I got the message. I had spent these past few weeks looking for punishment, hoping it would somehow numb my guilt. But how was my pain supposed to help anyone? I had become the new Mr. Fixit. I was going to dedicate my life to helping more people than I hurt. That was the best. The only way to atone. What's wrong, Id? You look like you've gone into brooding overdrive. What? No, I... I'm happy. Buddy, you ever heard of a smile? At this, the crowd laughed. I raised the corner of my lips, as if testing them. This made the crowd laugh harder. Sorry to interrupt, but could I have a word? It was one of the soldiers from the supply force. As some of you may already know, we weren't only responsible for transporting supplies. We were also tasked with assessing the resettlement effort. And I think it's no stretch to say the local monster presence is deadly. I'll have to ask the higher-ups to consider relocating. Shirolu answered before I could. Not a problem. We've got a beast slaying Mr. Fixit on our side. As the local Mr. Fixit, I've had a finger in every pie. From furniture repair to monster extermination to marriage counseling, I've seen it all. Though I admit the counseling did not come naturally to me. Still, I wanted to help in any way I could. I owed the skies that much. A new request came in today. From an old friend. Ed, was it my imagination or did I see you crack a smile? Lyria materialized at my shoulder and tried to read the forms in my hand. Yeah, work's been nice. I handed her the papers. And there, written in plain view, was the name of our latest patron. Shirolu. <laughs> 